We do have, okay, we're gonna get started. Through here, this one, when I go through the agenda? Yeah, that's your annotated. And this one is the, just two, two items of speakers. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee. I want to welcome our committee members, Happy New Year, and other members of council who are visiting here today. We have six items on today's agenda, very short for this committee. And in the room, uh, we have screens at the back, we have screens at the side with real-time time updates. So you can keep an eye on those to find out where we are in the agenda. Anybody watching online, you can check out toronto.ca backslash council uh, on your tablets or smartphones or computers to watch the proceedings. So I will call for declarations of interest at this time. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none. You don't own a bicycle, okay, make a note of that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mamaliti. <laughs> Item three is confirmation of minutes from last meeting. If I could have a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting, Councillor Holliday. And we would like to also confirm uh, the joint, the, you'll recall in late November we had a joint licensing and standards meeting, December 4th. Actually, it was, yes, it was actually December 4th. Uh, the, so if we get confirmation of those minutes as well, that's Councillor Carmichael Greb. And I guess I need to go back to the first set of minutes and say all those in favour, opposed, that carries. And the second set of minutes, all those in favour, uh, that carries as well. Nobody opposed. Okay, we're now going to run through the agenda. Again, it's shorter than we're used to, but we have uh, like at least two um, interesting items on here that we we'll have a number of speakers, uh, quite a few speakers that have come out. Uh, th that is listed on the green sheet. So let's go through the agenda and um, see what we can address through the agenda rundown. So to PW 26.1, amendment to purchase order number 6041437 for the new construction and rehabilitation of the process control building at Highland Creek treatment plant. Councillor Carmichael Greb is moving that. All in favor, that carries. PW 26.2. Contract award for tender call 200-2017, uh, contract number for the integrated pumping station site preparation, construction contract one at Ashbridge's Bay treatment plant. Councillor Holliday is moving that. All those in favour, that carries. PW 26.3, contract award for tender call 235-2017, uh, for the disinfection system at Ashbridge's Bay treatment plant. Councillor Holliday's moving that. All in favour, that carries. Yeah, it's, that's a big one. Very large. One of the biggest. PW 26.4, preparing for the City of Toronto's for AVs. That has got a number of speakers uh, with us here today. Uh, we're going to move on then. to the, I'll care, I will hold that in my name as the Chair. PW 26.5. Metrolinx Eglinton Crosstown LRT extension of the long-term roadway closures and Black Creek Drive partial and full closures. Councillor Carmichael Greb's favourite topic, our favourite organisation. Um, all those in favour, that carries. We'll move on. Uh, PW 26.6, reimagining Young Shepherd to Finch Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Study. And um, we've got a number of speakers on that, quite a few speakers on that. And so um, I'll hold that in my name for the time being. There's also an addition that the clerk is just advising me of. It's on your pink sheet. I don't know if it's been uh, distributed, but it's, uh, I guess it hasn't because it hasn't been introduced. It uh, requires a motion to add new business. Um, I'm just seeing this now. So I don't know if I should move to introduce that. If you'd like to distribute I don't know if Councillor, Okay. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna distribute that. I don't know if um, the general manager of solid waste is here, but it is related to his his purview. Okay, that would be great. So we're not adding it at this time. We're not adding it at this time, is what the clerk's indicating. Uh, we're just circulating it for information so people can review it. Kind of point of order. Is this not a policy already that we have? 
Well, that's why I asked about uh, the general manager being here, because my impression is that it's part and parcel of the long-term waste management strategy. It's built into that. Right, but so, shouldn't this go to council if it's a policy amendment of some kind? Well, I'm not even sure. Yeah, I guess, again, to be fair, there's no, there's no um, waste management issues on the, on the floor today, so that's why we don't have staff here. And this was just handed to me. Right. So, um, you know, upon quick view, my impression is this would be uh, built into the long, uh, the waste management strategy that we approved last year, the 10 year, or the 40 year. So it doesn't amend a pot, it doesn't amend. Um, so, so what, one suggestion from our uh, deputy city manager is to refer this to staff. Does that make sense? So I'll I introduce it. I think we all it. agree with that, yeah. I'll introduce it. All those in favor, uh, that carries. Um, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. We refer to staff for uh, inclusion in the solid waste management uh, long-term plans. Yep. And just Perfect. Okay, Councillor. Thank you very much. Well, I, you know, Ma Madam Chair, just you know, I'm going to support it, but these last-minute motions, uh, you know, they're very dangerous. I mean, what they do is they come up. It's like uh, you know, they sneak up on you, right? And then at the end of the day, they, they're going to cost us millions of dollars, and it's being done through committee. And, and I think it's going to amend a, a policy that only can be changed by council, right? So I don't even know how it got here, but I think it's the right thing to do is just to refer it off. But these last minute motions are really dangerous. Yeah, so I think most of us agree with you. I certainly do, Councillor Mamaliti. Um, I'm not a fan of these at all. I don't think it's good policy making, but um, that's what's before us. So Councillor Lee has a motion. I think it's a good one. So all in favor of Councillor Lee's motion, the clerk has it recorded. Uh, all that carries unanimously. No one opposed? Okay, so that leaves us, I believe, uh, with two items. <clears throat> and the two items um, are the auto uh, automated vehicles, AVs, as well as the um, EA. So uh, we'll start with the first item on the agenda. And um, there is a short presentation from staff. It's very short, brief, but uh, this is a bit of a inaugural moment for council because it's the first time we have a, a full comprehensive report before us on AVs. So it's um, important that you know, our, our colleagues get up to speed on this issue. So we have a short presentation from staff and then followed by some, a number of um, deputations. So uh, if staff could get into place. Good morning. Uh, I think I'll just kick right off while we get um, the tech in place. So uh, we are uh, excited to present our first um, paper uh, and presentation for information for the Committee on Automated Vehicles. And um, we're going to go over a couple of pieces. I have Ryan Lanyon who leads this file uh, for transportation and so I'm going to kick it off and he's going to um, finish it up for us. Uh, we want to talk about a couple of things. First is why is it important for the city to prepare for automated vehicles? What do we mean when we talk about automation? Because I think that there's a uh, very specific meanings and some levels of automation, some of which we're seeing on the road right now in terms of safety improvements in new vehicles and others that are still to come. Uh, what is the current legislative and legal framework that are being uh, dictated at the federal, provincial and local level and how can we help to shape that? Uh, what is our divisional work plan? We have one. We also have built a number of very fruitful partnerships and relationships both within the city uh, government and with uh, academia and you'll hear from some of our academic partners today as well uh, as with some professional organizations both in Canada and uh, in North America. Uh, what are we hearing in terms of public opinion on this topic and then what's the global context? So um, in terms of why prepare for automated vehicles, um, 
you know, a lot of people talk about driverless cars, and uh, we know that any kind of automation that's going to uh, provide more access for more people uh, and perhaps less uh, need for people to actually get in and drive their own car has the potential to dramatically change transportation in Toronto. Um, that change is forecasted, is happening over a long period of time. Uh, we think that there's uh, plenty of uh, opportunities and also lots of uh, investment in, in coming forward with many of these things sooner. And so we in Toronto want to be very prepared for that change. We want to help to drive and lead that change because it has certainly implications for uh, for our city. So in the short term, advanced Oh, sorry. In the short term, advanced driver assistance could improve safety. There's a lot of opportunity for increasing transportation efficiency, uh, reducing environmental impacts, uh, providing new economic development opportunities, and also there's uh, the ability to enhance equity by giving opportunity for transportation for people who can't or don't choose to drive. Uh, in the longer term, cars that can be uh, operated without a human driver could even further improve safety, uh, could reduce the cost of transportation and provide some additional mobility options and change how we actually manage and plan for the transportation system. So it's a really important thing that we get out ahead of this and we help to shape it. Uh, at the same time, if we don't do that, we have uh, certainly the potential for automated vehicles to spur more automobile use, to have more impact on our roads, to create more challenges uh, for employment. Um, and so we really do need to take this opportunity to anticipate those changes and plan for them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan to talk a little bit more about uh, what autonomy, automated vehicles mean. Thank you. So the good news really is that cities have been through this kind of transition in transportation before. Uh, we've got the experience of moving from the horse-drawn carriage to the automobile, and we've been able to learn those lessons over the last century of what unintended consequences uh, came about from that transition, some of the maybe challenges that were faced and ways that things could have been improved. So looking back at those lessons gives us an opportunity to really shape how automated vehicles can be used to help achieve our broader city goals. So a brief explanation about what automated vehicles are. Uh, there's really a wide range of them. So there's a six point scale that you see. Uh, areas one to five are the automated functions. So, so at the lower end of the scale, levels one and two are partial automation. And these are things we're already familiar with. Cruise control, uh, lane keeping, other technologies that are available. And so as you add more, the level of automation increases and you get to more highly automated vehicles. So at levels three, four, and five, the automobile starts to be able to drive itself. Uh, the real challenge is at level three, it's kind of an in-between. So a human still needs to serve as a backup, but mo much of the driving can be done by the automated system itself. At level four and level five, that's where you have the opportunity to remove the human from the car, and the vehicle will be able to drive without somebody on board, either remote controlled or at level five, it's a kind of a full autonomy. It's where the vehicle can operate in any circumstance and deal with any situation that it encounters. So in Ontario and Canada, there's been a, a number of activities around vehicle automation. Both the provincial and federal governments are, are supportive of vehicle automation and see it as an opportunity to advance economic development, equity, environmental goals, and broader transportation goals. So the province currently has a testing framework right now where any level three, four, or five vehicle can be tested by an original equipment manufacturer with a special permit. Uh, right now, the province is consulting on changing that framework so that level three vehicles can be used by the general public. Level four vehicles and level five vehicles wouldn't need a human operator for testing. So that's a proposal from the provincial government right now, and uh, we'll see how that follows in the, the coming year. So we at the city have been working hard to research, really understand this topic, figure out what the issues are, and start to plan about how we might respond to them and what options we can recommend to committee and council for addressing vehicle automation. So in transportation services, we formed a three-year work plan to do that research, to build some partnerships, and to develop an interdivisional working group spanning 20 divisions within the city so that we can come together and talk about not only how this impacts the transportation system, but our public health, our environmental goals, our economic development goals, really a broad range of city services and functions. So through that working group, we formed uh, a draft tactical plan, which is included in the report, to focus on ways that automation can support various city goals. Uh, and right now, it's very much a framework, but something we're looking to engage more discussion with our stakeholders and with the public on uh, in 2018. 
So a bit more about our partnerships and relationships. Uh, we've been reaching out to industry, reaching out to other orders of government, developing relationships, uh, particularly with the transportation ministries, but also with economic development, uh, municipal affairs, and our peer cities, because this is something that's facing cities right across the world. So as we've been able to network through NACDO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, through informal relationships in Canada, we've been able to share information and share some of our findings. We've also been working with other community stakeholders, uh, the universities in, in the city, uh, CAVCO, which is the Canadian Association of, uh, sorry, the Canadian, the Centre for Automated uh, Vehicle, sorry, the Canadian Automated Vehicle Centre of Excellence, um, and the Ontario Good Roads Association has formed a municipal alliance for connected and automated vehicles as well that we've been connecting with. So uh, city staff, as I mentioned, have formed that interdivisional working group. We do have a core team within transportation services, but we're working at a citywide level. The members of that working group, as I mentioned, there's about 20 of them, so you can see it's a broad range uh, from every cluster within the city. Uh, and we come together a few times a year to discuss and research these issues. So we did partner with Ryerson University and with Metrolinx to do a study on public opinion and consumer response to automation in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. So it was a sample survey of 3,200 residents uh, and we found that most had heard of a driverless car. The benefits of automation that they found most appealing were generally around road safety as well as providing support for people with disabilities. But we also found about half of residents in the GTHA said they would commute farther, all things being equal, if the vehicle was driving instead of them. So that's a, a bit of a uh, kind of foresight into what changes might come in the transportation system and with transportation demand from uh, the public. As to how governs, governments should respond, uh, half felt that government should monitor the situation, uh, about a quarter felt that government should be actively encouraging automation, and a, a small percentage thought that government should actively discourage automation. So just quickly, uh, as I mentioned, Toronto is one of a number of cities across the world that's working on vehicle automation, but we are out front. Uh, we have had other cities come to us to learn about the model with our in interdivisional working group to see how we're tackling this from a, a multi-divisional, multi-disciplinary perspective. And uh, we've been included in a, a global initiative called uh, the Bloomberg Aspen Initiative on Autonomous Vehicles uh, as recording what our activities have been and we've been able to share that with some of the leading cities in the world. So just lastly, some of our next steps are to continue researching and monitoring. There's a kind of a wealth of information out there and more and more being re released every day about predictions on how automation might take place, some of the consequences, how automated vehicles interact with pedestrians, cyclists, other road users. And so we see continuing to figure out these questions and just diving deeper and deeper with our partners in academia, within the, the city and within the industry. So, um, some pieces on that, we are working with the University of Toronto to um, support their setup of the ICT Centre for Automated and Transformative Technologies, continuing to work with Ryerson University School of Urban and Regional Planning, and also developing new relationships with uh, Waterloo and Harvard University for activities in 2018. And just lastly on that, uh, we are exploring opportunities for pilot projects and trying to see how we really get more exposure of automated vehicles and learn more about how they work on the ground. Thank you. Be succinct but informative. We're going to now move to our uh, deputations. Our speakers list is on the green sheet. And um, <clears throat> we're going to start with Andy, if Andy's here. Welcome. Uh, Executive Director of Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario. We've seen you before. Yeah. Welcome again. Um, so, I think we're going to do... Okay, so if you're ready, technically, uh, you've got... F okay, great. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so if you're ready, you can start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about RCCL so you know why we're here. Uh, we're a Labour Management Construction Alliance and a few years ago we became interested in 
what the potential impacts of AVs might be on our infrastructure planning world uh, because things are accelerating and moving very quickly. We uh, commissioned in 2015 former Deputy Minister Michael Fenn to do a study uh, that looked at uh, the future uh, trends and there was a follow-up report called Mega Trends. We actually engaged a futurist but we also had Byrne Grush and John Niles out of Seattle contribute a section on transportation infrastructure to that 2015 report. So as a result of uh, dipping our toe in the water, we ended up uh, commissioning Byrne Grush to do uh, two studies, one which was released in October of 2016, and they both have that word prepare in there, Ontario must prepare for vehicle automation, automated vehicles can influence urban form congestion and infrastructure delivery, and then we did a part two report how skilled governance can influence its outcome, and that was released in October of 2017. And uh, just so you know, uh, we did some AV lunch and learns uh, both at Queen's Park and uh, Bern uh, did go to Ottawa and talk to the various departments there. So we're trying to get plugged in and, and just get people talking about this so that we can prepare. Uh, one of the things um, in the first report was that, you know, robotization, um, of transportation vehicles has made traditional 20 plus year infrastructure planning uh, a, a lot more difficult. I mean, we, uh, Ryan was talking about the horse and buggy era and that was probably a 40 year phase. The things that are happening right now are happening very quickly uh, and we've got major players, the automotive sector, the Googles and uh, the car sharing type companies, uh, Uber, Lyft and so forth. So uh, the authors recommended that Ontario and the municipal sector uh, develop policy directions that will lead to more desirable outcomes than just hoping that everything would sort itself out. So in that regard, we're uh, very pleased that the City of Toronto is taking a proactive stance on preparing for AVs. And I think um, in your, um, you know what, I probably run out of time, so why don't I just uh, get going here. If there's questions, we can proceed that way. There we go. Every year, 1.2 million people are killed in automobile accidents. 90% of these worldwide fatalities are caused by human error. Over the next 40 years, electric-powered automated vehicles have the potential to address this road carnage and transform how we live. They could mitigate the effects of traffic congestion while still providing freedom of mobility. But let's be clear, there are too many variables for a completely accurate prediction. Here's one scenario. Based on the speed of innovation, we can expect the adoption of this technology in four phases, one decade per phase. Phase one, the 2020s, will see mostly semi-automated personal vehicles. This will add to traffic and parking demand. We also should see the introduction of short trip, fully automated vehicles. Phase 2, the 2030s, will see robo-taxis and shuttles provide first mile and last mile transit services, moving people from home and work to transit nodes. Semi-automated will become more popular for personal use, which also could increase traffic and parking demand. Phase 3, the 2040s, we will witness a sharp decline in full driver control as automated vehicles, or AAVs, become more prevalent. In Phase 4, the 2050s, Full automation will rise while non and semi fall. There are still many unanswered questions. Will AV rides be cheaper than transit? How will this impact public transit? Will we need more road space or less? Will people buy into shared services or still demand personal vehicles? It is impossible to know the answers, but we can prepare for and influence how semi and fully automated vehicles are integrated into our transportation systems. We need to build cities that use technologies in smarter ways, like on-demand microtransit and cost-effective shared services. In doing so, we can prioritize building cities and towns first, then think of technology as an enabler. With a proactive approach, governments and commercial operators can work together to create a system that enhances our mobility options in a future AV world. This information is based on the report, Ontario Must Prepare for Vehicle Automation, How Skilled Governance Can Influence Its Outcome. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, I should you... just add, uh, for Councillor Mamaliti's sake, uh, when we saw the first draft of the video, there were no cyclists in there. So we, uh, we're certainly supportive of complete streets uh, that encourage walking and cycling. I think you made his day. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, he's got a question for you. Big mistake. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Councillor Mamaliti. So I, I, I'm actually excited about it because when I'm in my 90s, I'll be able to just order a car to do whatever I want. Right? Potentially. So what happens when uh, that particular car... If you don't get into an it, accident before that. Well, he's going to. No, not that he's going to get into. Uh, what happens uh, if that when that particular car is 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 driving down a downtown street uh, in its own casual way, not being perhaps as aggressive as some other ca uh, some other cars in getting through intersections, and upset a, and upset a, a cyclist? Who, that cyclist, what car are they going to kick? Are they going to show their frustration to who? Because it's an automated car, uh, and it's my view that that because they're, they're not going to be as aggressive, perhaps some drivers trying to get through intersections, there'll be more congestion. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with that? Uh, there's a, a lot of things that, that are packed into there. Um, certainly there's a lot of ethicists uh, and philosophers that are uh, trying to tackle these questions because uh, the vehicles do have built-in algorithms. So nowadays the primary focus is the safety of the passenger, but there has this dilemma situation of there being a pedestrian or a cyclist or a woman in a baby carriage and so forth, and what do you do? You know, do you go uh, hit oncoming traffic or do you hit the pedestrian? These are really tough issues. Um, so, that, you know, these types of things will not be resolved very easily. And of course, the insurance industry is very interested, but the city as well has to be interested because there could be some liability for the city if sensors aren't embedded right. properly. Well, it is an issue. It is an it's issue. It's a big issue. Yeah. Um, What, what are we going to do? I mean, have we, have we seeked an opinion of our labor force? Uh, are, are, are people going to lose their jobs over, over automated cars? We have, a, a, we have staff that, that drive our trucks in the city of Toronto. Uh, they drive our cars. Have, have they given us an indication of how they feel about this? Well, we've seen uh, with respect to public transit in the city of Toronto that uh, the Scarborough RT, for example, does have driverless. Uh, but the rest of the system, there are staff on board. Uh, with the future, if it goes to level five, um, in terms of um, microtransit as well as rail services, there will be disruption. And my personal opinion is you're not going to replace those jobs with uh, the same equivalent of software programmers. So there's job losses? I think so. Yeah. yeah. And would that, would that amount to garbage pickup as well? the job losses, if we're gonna go automated, I would assume that our garbage trucks will be all automated as well, right? Probably everything's on the table. I know for major construction projects, some of the heavy machinery is completely automated now. Then, then I, you know what, I, I don't understand why our, our labor force are not at these meetings telling us what they think. We're about to venture into to doing something with this report, I don't know what that is. But if we're clearly telling our labor force that there's going to be layoffs based on, the, on these kinds of reports, I'd like to know what they're thinking. Have, have we done any consultation with them at all? Do you know whether we have or not? I'm not aware of that. I know that. What the I know staff has done. Yeah. But he, he, he'd be more inclined to tell me the truth. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not aware of any uh, direct consultation, no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holliday is next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Similar to Councillor Mamaliti's line of questionings, I'm just thinking about what Santa brought my kids at Christmas. They got this toy called a Spiro. It's his ball, and inside is some servos and gyroscopes. This is for little kids, you know, eight, nine years old. And the trick is, it's not just a robot, but you actually have to take your device and you have to code it. Mm -hmm. And the game is, is you have to teach it to do things, and you enter, you know, coordinates and distances. So. I've also discovered that schools are adopting these toys all over the place as a way to teach math and coding. Mm -hmm. So children are growing up right now with the understanding of robots, and mm -hmm. I think it will be commonplace as they get older. And to Councillor Mamalita's question, we, we've, we're talking about transportation mm -hmm. in a lot of this report, but where do you see work automation and the mashup of vehicles on the street? So, you know, further to construction, you know, I'm thinking about 
trash pickup, I'm thinking about grass cutting, salting sidewalks, cleaning sidewalks, uh, maintenance, line painting. Do you think um, that is accelerating faster because it's a different driver, it's a cost driver and it's a, a work quality and speed driver? And do you think we'll see more of those type of robots, let's call them, instead of automated vehicles? And is that captured in some of the forecasts of your report? Uh, Bern Grush uh, points out that, you know, you can't predict the future. Uh, you know, there's the Yogi Berra quote and all those sorts of things. Um, as an example, Uber and Lyft right now has kind of a, a model, but eventually that model could have driverless. I think the main message, however, is that if you try to do everything all at once, it'll be overwhelming. So I, I believe the steps that the City of Toronto are proposing in terms of doing pilot projects is the best way to proceed. So for example, first last mile or kilometer, if that's your preference, solutions where you take individuals to uh, uh, TDC stations or GO stations in a geo-fenced area is a, is a good way to go. Burn, for example, uh, uses a very strong word. Uh, I wouldn't use it, but he said, you know, public bus systems will be decimated. So we've seen in a rural area like the town of Innisfil, where they cut a deal with Uber. So the good part about that deal is, and I don't know the, the, the details of it, but Uber has agreed to provide the municipality with data. That's the kind of thing that the City of Toronto would want to do when it engages these sorts of suppliers to make sure that they can get data. And in terms of social equity, like seniors mobility, 90 plus year old people, you may not want them on the road, but you want to provide the services so they can still get around and visit friends, go to the bingo hall, hospital appointments, whatever. Do you think uh, using robotic equipment or, or automatic equipment in say even a smaller setting in say a park or some kind of a, you know, a geofence setting mm -hmm. might be a good vector to teach us the lessons that we need to know as things scale up and you start having higher speed vehicles that maybe carry passengers at some point in time? I think so. It's a good I mean, start. Th there's a lot of jurisdictions in the U.S. that don't have our kind of climate, although, you know, there's an exception with Florida getting snow and stuff like that. But uh, probably our experiments in the summer would be better served, and then we can start getting into more inclement weather conditions as well and do that sort of testing. So we have a somewhat more dynamic weather pattern here than southern climes, for example. Actually, upon reflection, I wasn't going to ask the question anymore. But but let me just uh, let me since I have the microphone and I have an opportunity to say something, let me just say that just to sort of elevate um, Councillor Mamaliti's conclusion just just slightly um, uh, in terms of your answer to his question, there are going to be job losses. So what happened to the and you may not know the answer to this. What happened to the horse and buggy makers when we went from the horse and buggy to the car? Mm -hmm. I'm on back because you want to get rid of them. <laughs> what happened to those folks? There were, were, they, were they all just simply now unemployed and just kind of like sat at home and did nothing the rest of their lives? Or, or did they move on and, I don't know, go on to make cars or something? I don't have specific numbers on that, but with any new technology, there will be disruption. Right. And so there's a transition period. Over time, I think you could probably make a good argument that the automotive sector had some pros and cons to it, but there's certainly lots of jobs over time which were able to scale up compared to, you know, the horse uh, on the streets. You know, you may have had jobs uh, cleaning up horse dung and that sort of thing, um, you know, replaced by higher skilled jobs. Right, right. So every time there's been sort of a, a step forward in terms of uh, incorporations of new technologies or, or changes, um, you know, our, our economic systems are restructured uh, mm -hmm. in a sense, and and uh, and people find their way in that in that new economy or in that new uh, um, um, in that new era. Yeah, there's always going to be uncertainty. It's going to be scary, and there will be people that will suffer losses for sure. So he should hang on to his britches. There may be some changes, that, some of which might actually be positive, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Conservative Thanks. trying to represent. <laughs> uh, is that it? Thank you very much. You. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Judy Farvalin. From, she's a program director at the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute. Welcome. 
I don't know if you've got. Oh, Eric, you are also speaking. We're going to do sort of a oh, that's terrific. Great. We'll do our presentation. All, all okay, so you know what, Eric uh, and Judy, I'll let you introduce yourselves and your team, and um, we'll give you the full time. Thank you for coming. Okay, well, oh, great. And th thank you, Madam Chair, and the committee for providing us with this opportunity to speak to you on the release of the report preparing the City of Toronto for automated vehicles. Uh, as the chairs uh, mentioned, I'm Dr. Eric Miller, Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Toronto and Research Director of the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute, which we refer to uh, as UTRI. Uh, to my immediate right is uh, Dr. Judy Farvolden, our, our Program Director, and also with us is Pat Doherty, our Communications Coordinator. Um, UTRI's uh, aim is to make transportation research at the University of Toronto meaningful and useful to our partners in government and indus industry. Uh, we're a consortium of researchers from civil industrial, electrical, computer, and chemical engineering, geography and planning, computer science, the Monk School of Global Affairs, economics, the Rotman School of Management, and the Daniels Faculty of Architecture. Um, as the staff report uh, notes, automated vehicles have the potential to reshape our transportation system, impacting road safety, traffic congestion, mobility, equity, uh, economic opportunity, and environmental health. Uh, the staff report also notes the pervasive implications for many departments and divisions of the city, including city planning, environment and energy, equity, fire, police and fleet services, employment, uh, employment parking, public health, TTC and revenue, among others. Beyond the impact on city services, the advent of AVs is going to have a profound impact on almost every aspect of people's daily lives. Transportation Services and the University of Toronto are collaborating in a research program to help the City of Toronto prepare for the advent of uh, autonomous vehicles. We would like to explain that collaboration, why it is important, and how it will help the City achieve the goals defined in the tactical plan. Uh, Transportation Services' work to date places Toronto at the forefront of thought leadership, but we have a long way to go, and there is some urgency to stay ahead of the wave of disruptive change that is coming our way. We would also like to recommend actions the committee can take to establish Toronto as a thought leader and engage other levels of government. Last July, UTRI launched a new center for automated and transformative transportation systems, which we call CATS. Uh, research mandate of CATS is precisely to investigate and quantify the impact of AVs under various alternative future scenarios with the explicit goal of helping policy and decision makers in our cities and regions to prepare for the pervasive impacts and disruptions of AVs. Modeling and simulating alternative futures will provide insight into the impact of policies on increasing or decreasing road and parking capacity, transit fares and road charges, all of which affect travel times and cost and thus demand and therefore vehicle kilometers traveled and resulting congestion and emissions. The modeling will account for both the movement of people and freight by drone deliveries and sidewalk robots as well as by ubiquitous delivery vehicles dropping off online purchases. The Dean of Engineering at the University of Toronto has made an initial investment of $450,000 to launch this multidisciplinary collaborative research centre. Its the first achievement has been to create a collaborative research vision with partners that include the cities of Toronto and Mississauga, regions of York and Peel, Waterfront Toronto, the Mars Discovery District, Esri Canada and GM Canada. This vision became the basis of a grant proposal submitted to the Ontario Research Fund for a $12.5 million five-year research project. We will, we will learn in March if that application has been successful. We continue to seek additional partnerships and funding in support of this work. There are many questions with respect to AVEs, but the most important is, what do you want the future to be? I suspect that you would agree with me that it needs to be equitable, sustainable and prosperous. This is the future we have to plan for. CATS research will help decision makers to explore how the policy levers they control can be used to achieve that future. CATS researchers will work with our municipal and regional colleagues to design alternative future scenarios that help decision makers design the policies, programs and services we need to maintain and enhance, enhance the livability of our city. U of T has a long history and extensive expertise in modeling, simulation, data and analytics and support of evidence-based decision making. We are exceedingly well positioned to undertake this work. UTRI has over 30 years of experience in developing models of the demand for travel from place to place, by time of day, by different modes, that in the aggregate describe how travel patterns in the region will change in response to proposed government policies. It is the home of the, the, of the Demand Modeling Group, or DMG, which has administrated the Transportation Tomorrow Survey, called TTS, from 1986 to 2011, and is now developing survey methods for the next generation of surveys that will exploit new technologies such as smartphones to collect travel behavior information. TTS provides the fundamental data needed by the province and all municipalities in the Greater Toronto Area, notably including the City of Toronto, to undertake transportation planning analysis, modeling, and decision making. 
As far as we are aware, the TTS Data Collection Program is the largest urban travel survey program in the world, and the DMG Public Sector Collaboration is a world-leading example of sustained government university collaboration in support of improving the evidence base for transportation planning and decision-making. Building upon the TTS data, we have also been the developer of the GTA model series of travel demand forecasting models that city planning has used for all strategic transportation planning studies over the past 20 plus years. The current version, GTA model version 4.0, was brought online in late 2015 for use in the Smart Track ridership study and has been in operational use by city planning ever since, with literally, literally thousands of model runs being undertaken to analyze the relief line, Smart Track, and every other trans major transportation initiative under consideration by the city. Utree has expertise in intelligent transportation systems, transit planning and operations, pedestrian and cyclist travel, the environmental, public health, and social impacts of access to transportation, land use impacts, urban good movement, and more. At this point, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Farvolden, who will speak to the importance of the AV issue and our support for the city's AV tactical plan. Thank you very much, and thank you to the committee. I'm going to begin by talking about why I believe this work is important. And that is, in this particular work, compared to other work that's being undertaken in the AV space, most of the current interest in AV in government and industry focuses on advancing AV technology and creating opportunities for economic development in related industry sectors. Traditional automotive manufacturers and new entrants like Google have spent billions of dollars on developing the technology. Their singular focus is on the bottom line. The focus of this work is different. And that's because governments at all levels must continue to plan for and manage policies, programs, and services in the best interests of residents with diverse needs, which even under a business as usual scenario is a challenging task, as you know. An AV future will be far from business as usual, but so far there's only speculation about whether or not AVs will increase or decrease congestion, improve or exacerbate social equality, have a net positive impact on access to employment opportunities, increase or decrease mobility and transit ridership, be supportive or not of climate action plans like Transform TO. Why is there this uncertainty? Think about how you chose to travel to work today. Did you drive and park, walk or take transit? How did your children get to school? Do they have access to a car? Did you drop them off? Did they walk or take transit? Do you have an elderly parent with mobility issues who, who perhaps should not be driving but cannot use transit who wants to access social events and needs to get to medical appointments. You, your children, your parents, your constituents decide what mode of travel to take to get to work, to school, to shopping, based on the choices available to them. Do they have a car? Do they live near, tran near transit? Then they choose that option that is cheapest for them. Through a very personally derived calculation of their cost, in terms of actual dollar costs, time, comfort, and in rare cases, social good. It turns out that people do not do a good job of accurately assessing the cost of travel. They don't count the cost of vehicles, insurance, and most maintenance. Once that money is spent, it's gone. They do consider out-of-pocket costs like gas, parking, and tolls, which they compare to transit fares and will eventually compare to the cost of using automated vehicles through ownership or sharing. The introduction of AVs will change their perception of those costs and with it, the choices that they make. If I can relax on my commute, work, sleep, or watch a movie, will I be willing to lengthen my commute and relocate in search of cheaper housing? How many Torontonians would make the same move? If travel by AV is perceived as cheaper, faster, and more comfortable than walking, biking, or transit, will there be a modal shift away from active modes of transportation and transit and towards private or shared AV travel? People who have fewer choices due to age, mobility, or location will have more choices, creating additional travel demand. Increased mobility is a good thing. Increased traffic is not. Providing people with more options is a good thing. Falling public transit ridership and increased congestion is not. We may not have more cars in the Navy future, but we will certainly have increased demand and increased vehicle kilometers traveled. The promise is that AVs will reduce con congestion, the promise of the technology. What performance of that technology is required in terms of speed, following distance and maneuvering so that AVs relieve rather than exacerbate congestion? At this point, we have only questions. CATS research is designed to um, align with the issues raised in the staff report and will help the City of Toronto achieve many elements of the tactical plan described in the report and help us find answers to some of these questions. For example, 
The report says the City of Toronto will encourage the adoption of advanced driver assistance systems in a manner that improves social equity. That's a very important goal, but how will we improve social equity? We first need to define social equity, then understand the drivers of social equity, then design policies on services and their prices to improve equity and the metrics to measure change. The CAS research program will then simulate the performance of the transportation system under those candidate policies and use the metrics to measure the impact on social equity. And likewise, we can post scenarios on the impact, impact on health, the environment, economic develop, development, and other so important social outcomes. The tactical plan states the City of Toronto will adopt AV technology that improves the reliability, efficiency, safety, and seamlessness of transit and gives transit priority. Again, computer model simulations can identify which policies achieve these improvements and increase the transit modal split. CATS research can help the city transform the technical plan to an action plan. Insights achieved through our collaboration will help the City of Toronto design the policies it needs to achieve its visions and goals with respect to city building, economic vitality, environmental sustainability, social development, and physical, fiscal sustainability in an AV future. We'd like to make some suggestions. Um, it's very important in this uh, digital future that we preserve access to data. Data privacy issues are important, but data ownership and access to data are also concerns. The city must pre preserve its access to the data it needs to understand the needs of residents and for planning and delivering services to them. We want to commend the city on the position that it's taken and encourage it to take, continue to take a leadership position. The city should continue to build partnerships to create a larger coalition among GTA municipalities and regions and higher levels of government. As the staff report notes, jurisdiction over vehicles and roads is shared by Transport Canada and the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario. The, Federal the Federation of Canadian Municipalities mandate is to monitor and influence policy issues at the federal level. We recommend that Toronto City Council make a resolution to include a discussion of autonomous vehicles on the agenda of an upcoming FCM meeting and get it onto their radar and agenda. The FCM's Big City Mayor's Caucus is the voice of Canada's biggest cities. We recommend that Toronto City Council, Council make the caucus aware of its good work to date. The city should take a leadership role in the Municipal Alliance for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles in Ontario, established by the Ontario Good Roads Association. We also see this as an opportunity to create further opportunities for academic collaboration. Steve Buckley, ex-general manager of transportation services, created an opportunity for his division to engage in research initiatives or projects that contributed to achieving the mission of the City of Toronto Transportation Services. Our current collaboration with transportation services to pre prepare the city for automated vehicles is possible because Mr. Buckley had a bylaw passed that permits transportation services to collaborate with post-secondary educational institutions in Canada that can provide objective, qualified, professional expertise. The contract we have used refers to Schedule A of the City of Toronto Municipal Code, Chapter 71, Financial Control Bylaw, 541-2014. We asked the committee to request that city staff uh, report back to the committee on how they can amend this bylaw to expand the scope of collaboration opportunities to other civic divisions, agencies, boards, and commissions so they can also benefit, if they so choose, from academic collaboration. At a re recent meeting with, T with UTRI, TTC leadership expressed interest in being enabled by such an agreement. The University of Toronto and the City of Toronto signed a memorandum of understanding on October 2, 2017. Um, the MOU says that we will work together to identify opportunities to meet our shared goals, including making Toronto a better place to live, learn, work, and prosper. An MOU describes a mutual intention, a bylaw enabling other divisions, agencies, boards, and commissions to partner with U of T's vast expertise, as well as with other universities, both locally and nationally, would move this from intention to opportunities for action. In closing, I'd like to note that UTRI has been involved with the city's AV initiative since the initial workshop in March 2015, produced a discussion paper driving changes and workshops of 2016, and we look forward to continuing the collaboration through the CATS program. We aim to support the city with data and analysis in support of evidence-based decision-making as you continue to plan for and manage the public works and infrastructure of the City of Toronto. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the committee for allowing us this opportunity to speak on behalf of our colleagues at U of T. Thank you. And are we, are, are, are Pat, is Pat speaking or? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you. Good answer. 
We actually have some questions for you, starting with Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for speaking to us. Um, in the report, it talks a little bit about, and you alluded to congestion, and, I, and specifically I'm interested in how automated vehicles might increase throughput on roads, and I wondered if you'd seen any work on that or, or have some thoughts on how they may perform better. Uh, there, there is a, a small but growing body of research into this, uh, but it, it like, like almost everything I think with AVs, it's very mixed. It depends upon your assumptions. Everything I've seen is really looking at AVs on sort of unrestricted highway, uh, platoons going down, and there's no doubt in that environment um, you would increase, uh, increase th throughput. What I haven't seen, and certainly one of the things we want to be doing at the university, is looking at, first of all, what happens when those cars re reach the egress ramp. Um, and then what happens with them on, their, on the street. Uh, I think our view is that many of the claims for uh, significant congestion relief, significant uh, capacity increases are overstated because they simply ignore the complexity of travel, particularly on streets. Uh, but, but even on access ramps, as, as soon as a queue starts, it doesn't matter whether the vehicle's automated or not. So I think it's gonna take a lot of, lot of experimentation uh, to discover how best, uh, to what extent we can get capacity increases. Similarly on streets, uh, you see simulations where cars are doing this at intersections, right? Where are the pedestrians? Uh, so I, I, I think in my view, a lot of the analysis today has been fairly naive. I, I think there will be improvements. The biggest improvement may be safety to the extent that we do get rid of accidents, which cause a huge amount of delay. That will improve the system, I think, almost certainly. So you, you mentioned platoons, and I guess the, the, these systems would assemble vehicles into you know, logical arrays and, and move them along, but wouldn't the computer systems know, let's say I'm flying along the garden, or gonna go off at the Spadina ramp, by the time I leave my house in Etobicoke, the computer already knows that's where I'm going, and could probably predict that I'm gonna be at the light at Spadina in front by X time, and could probably adjust at that point, like, so, I mean, this is a bit yeah. far into the future, and maybe I should articulate my question a little bit better. If you ever think of, you ever seen videos of schools of fish swimming, um, you know, Mother Nature has found a way that the, these fish kind of vibrate to this secret tune that you don't yeah. see, and they, they, their spacing is automated and they move together, and, you know, I sort of see a vision of a future of where cars will do that, right? They'll, they'll work a, as groups and they'll be perfected by some system. Do you see that as being a decentralized system that the, maybe the automakers or private companies will sort of figure out how these things talk and assemble, or do you see a role of government sort of having a master control on the switch on how we implement policies on the spacing of vehicles and speeds and all that kind of stuff in our jurisdiction so that we can optimize the system like a big computer to make it work in a perfect way? Okay, well, I think there were several questions there. Very, yeah. very interesting Where's comments. Where's the future going, maybe? That's, yeah, that's uh, the question. Um, uh, this notion that you leave your home and, and somebody, the system will know when you're hitting the Spadina ramp. Um, yeah, maybe very far in the future, but that really uh, assumes a very high level of connectivity as well as automation. And we tend, in our discussions, we always tend to simplify, and so we think about autonomous vehicles um, and assume they're connected. Uh, but connectivity is a much more difficult technical problem. So Google can run a car down the road, it's automated. It's not talking to anybody yet. And that, that, that crosstalk between vehicles or with systems, uh, the communications challenges there are, are phenomenal. And, and uh, so I think that's a very distant future thing. But one could maybe imagine that. Um, I think it, whatever control will be, it almost has to be more decentralized. Maybe, the, I like the analogy to the school of fish, maybe the cars on the road are self-organizing and, and some signals are being sent downstream. You, you'll never be able to have, I, I don't think it would be possible to ever have a central computer, let's say, uh, that's controlling the entire system. The communications and, and the time lags and the time within which you have to make decisions are, are just too, uh, too, too short. Uh, so I think if this is, that's to come, it will be a, a, a dynamic, decentralized system. At, at UOT, we've developed, just for traffic signals, this sort of thing, and we find local control, you don't need central control with smart local control. Okay, yeah, I think that was my fear, is that maybe the government would then have a role in getting into supercomputing to yeah. try to manage its geography. Yeah. I guess, and the last question, and I'll be cognizant of the time, um, in the letter um, that you submitted, there's a little bullet point here that talks about, you know, sort of the dangers of reducing public transportation, right? You know, are the autonomous vehicles going to become so attractive that you've got 
falling public transit, transit ridership. And I wondered if, in thinking about that, if you looked at today's model of public transportation, or maybe humbly I'll say I have a larger view of what public transit could be in 20, 30, 40 years, and you know, maybe it is these little pods where two or three people get into it versus a bus or a subway, that the notion, of the, 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 the gap between pu private and public transit might come a lot closer, and I wondered if you saw a future of that. Yes, I think absolutely. I mean, I think the, 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 this, this, there's a blurring between what a car and transit. I, I think the future, uh, I think there's a huge future for mini transit, uh, little pods. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was, uh, Vernon Grush was quoted saying maybe the public, the, the diesel bus in the suburb is maybe a dinosaur and will disappear. And I think that, uh, but I think, I think even 30, 40 years from now, whatever, we're going to need mass transit because, so I think what you're looking for is a, uh, a combination of using the, the new autonomy and, and small cars, microtransit, to get people to the subway stop or the commuter rail stop. Because, a, 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 again, the, the, you, you won't be able to bring everybody who has to come into downtown Toronto, even fully connected, your, your school fish car is coming down, you're not going to be able to carry the number of people into downtown. So I think one of the real public policy dangers is people say, oh, we're going to solve congestion, we don't need to spend the billions we think we need to spend on, on rail because it, we won't need in the future. I, I, I don't think that's, that's the future, but, but there are exciting opportunities to reinvent transit using automation. Okay, another question for you from, uh, and I'll just tell committee that uh, you may be misled a bit. The, the next two names are not, speakers are not here and not speaking, so these are our last speakers, just so everybody's in the aware. The postdoctoral fellows are not here, or they may be here, but they're not speaking. So, Councillor Mamalady, you're next. I'm, in, one, in, in one way, I'm, I'm excited about the future, and, and in another sense, I'm very scared. Uh, I think we and, agree with you, actually. And, 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 I, and I, I can envision more congestion with automated vehicles, not less, because automated vehicles are going to make sure that every law is adhered to and will be slower and will wait for every pedestrian to cross the street, which will be a lot longer in an intersection, which means a lot more lineups through that intersection. Can you envision that with automated vehicles? I don't know that that specific case you're speaking of, because I think there will still be traffic lights. Uh, I don't think we, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where, again, the, the uh, AVs are just somehow supposed to be going through intersections and pedestrians are fighting with them somehow. I think there'll still be intersection control. So that pedestrian AV interaction may not be a problem. But I think you're actually right that, um, I mean, as I say, I, I, we share your concerns. That's why we want to do the research, because we think there could well be greater congestion um, for a whole bunch of reasons, one of which yeah, is the cars will, will obey the speed limits. And, 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 I, and I say that just based on how I drive. Now, I'm, I'm relatively good, uh, and I, I obey most of the laws most of the time. Uh, and I'll admit I even break them once in a while. But I break them in an effort to get traffic through the intersection faster. In other words, I can wait for every single pedestrian to cross if I'm turning right or I could try to just squeeze myself in at the first break I get. With automated vehicles, they're not gonna do that. They're gonna wait for every single pedestrian, which means that could be five or six lights worth of waiting in a downtown core. I, I, I think we, if, if and when we get to this point, there will be new behavior. I mean, people will have to adjust. Behavior will adjust. We, we will learn how to work with these things. But uh, I think the more general point is that, you know, the claims that somehow autonomous vehicles are going to cure congestion is wrong or reduce vehicle kilometers travel. They will increase, almost certainly increase. Uh, so the question is, how do we manage that? Um, maybe if there, those kilometers are being traveled more efficiently somehow, maybe congestion doesn't go up. So this is, this is why the, the, the sort of research we're talking about the sort of, in the, in the sort of uh, the tactical plans this, this, this transportation service is talking about is we have to really look into these okay. questions. And, and I actually agree with that, but this only this this whole thing only 
It only reinforces my argument that roads should be just for cars. And, and if we're going to go automated, how, how are they going to share that road with the cyclists? And furthermore, road rage is typically uh, between two drivers or cyclists with the driver. So the cyclists are still going to get uh, very irritated by now a robot. So who are they going to kick? when that happens? Uh, I, I'm not sure I have, I have a comment maybe on that one particular. Maybe we'll, just, maybe we'll move on. Maybe let's move on. Yeah, so. I, I, I think I just wanted to, to, to make a point there. But, but you understand what, where I'm coming from is how, how is everyone going to share the road with automated cars on it when, when there's, in my opinion, there'll be more congestion and there'll be more frustration uh, just based on the system that we're setting up right now. Can I, can I say, then the purpose of our research is to test this in simulation and not on our streets, um, because uh, we would talk about breaking it in simulation rather than actually imposing it on people, though pilots are important. Even before we launch a pilot and test important things like this on the, this on the street, we can test it in the lab and, and, and look at those alternatives and see what the implications are for all kinds of people and how all kinds of people are trying to get around. I would imagine the implications to any one city uh, is going to be a huge infrastructure cost uh, just to accommodate the automated car. And that probably means everything that we're, we're, we're implementing on our intersections and in our roads and our sidewalks, whether, whether they have some kind of detect, detective, uh, detect, detection advice built into the concrete or whether it's uh, a new form of lighting, uh, I would imagine this thing's gonna cost municipalities a fortune. And that's why we believe, and we're glad the staff uh, report came out, and it's on the, the agenda today, that we have to begin to prepare for this. I, I, I agree. Okay, Councillor Lee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Miller, thank you very much for your good work and uh, all your colleagues as well. Uh, and thank you for coming to my meeting in 2012 to help, and uh, now it's smart track. We uh, called it a U-train back then. My question is that, uh, similar to the uh, previous uh, speaker, you know, the contention is that uh, our roads are not ready for the automated uh, vehicle. Uh, what do you think that we need to do in the interim from now until the, you know, what we need to do when we are rebuilding our roads that uh, we need to do right now or in the near future to make it ready? Well, I think, um, and it, it kind of actually comes back to a bit of what Councilor Mamalidi was saying uh, in terms of um, control systems. I mean, I think even with aut autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, I, I know Transportation Services is looking at, uh, you know, improved monitoring of streets, um, you know, always looking to, for ways to improve the traffic control system. And, and so I think that, that work is going to be ongoing uh, regardless of whether autonomous vehicles comes or not. So I think I see that the more the more the more the roadway becomes an information um, network as well as a physical network. So we un we are able to see what's going on on the roadway. Even now, that will improve improve flows, but it'll be positioning you for for autonomous vehicle operations. I think I think also uh, you know again even without autonomous vehicles, the issue of complete streets and how we do share road space between bicycles and pedestrians and cars and and you know delivery vehicles and every everything else is an issue that exists and challenges all of us uh, regardless of autonomous vehicles. So the more we continue to sort that out and what what does make sense in terms of how to best use streets that will prepare us better for when some of the cars are autonomous. Um, but I think also, and again, what we keep arguing is, is for is there's lots we can be doing now in terms of uh, thinking about all these various scenarios, all these concerns, and, and, and in the virtual lab of the computer and simulating, exploring these things. So, we, so we're starting to identify futures, first of all, that are possible, I think, there's a lot of hype right now about these things. I think there's a lot of things being talked about that just will never happen. So if we can identify that and say, let's not worry about that anymore. And, but there's going to be a very large set of possibilities. Then what we need to be doing is identifying the good futures, the futures that we, we want to be here, we don't want to be there. And then you can start thinking about 
whether it is infrastructure investment or it's government policies, uh, and, and working with the equipment suppliers and so forth, and working with transit to start the process in advance of the AVs to get us moving in directions where, where when the AVs do come, they will be beneficial uh, rather, rather than, than, than creating disbenefits. So that's a very vague answer, but I think it's a lot of different things, and I think there's a lot of just good traffic engineering, good planning, that we are doing and can continue to do, um, regardless of whether the AVs are coming or not. Okay. Thank you. For you, and some of them have already been touched on a bit. So, um, first of all, thank you for bringing out your A team, and thank you for the great work you're doing with uh, with city, the city of Toronto, City Hall, and uh, beyond. It's very important that we have experts like you involved in this process. And I guess my first question is. Phase one and two versus phase three and four. How, do this, how does that really differ in your minds from a policy, regulation, infrastructure perspective, the two phases, as we, as we work towards full automation? There's a messiness, there's a messiness in there. Um, I, think, I think these are, again, questions and, and that we don't have answers to. And, uh, and certainly in, this trans in the transition that you talk about from uh, being semi-automated to fully automated, there will be a messiness. Um, we'll have people on the roads in their own vehicles and people on the roads perhaps in their own vehicles that will be automated. And, um, and how those, you know, we can talk about how automated vehicles will interact, how their algorithms will drive them to interact, how will drivers interact with automated vehicles. Um, so I, th I think that's um, a, a really big question, and I, I think, therefore, it's really important to get out in front of this um, with uh, a, a framework, an operating framework, a regulatory framework that uh, addresses the important things in this um, that are the city's responsibility, like public safety, you know, because because it will happen to us. Um, and we'll remember that Uber didn't ask before it introduced itself onto our streets. Uh, automated vehicles at various levels of automation will hit our streets as they become available. And it will be important, important that we're ready for it um, with the framework that we want, under which we want them to operate. And I think we don't know what that is yet, but we would again propose to model that, simulate it, see what we can learn from it, and, and help you inform those decisions. It will be messy. And I think also it has to be an incremental process. Uh, you know, you start with small pilots, you start with, you know, just shuttle buses to a, a train station, you learn by it. I mean, again, one thing we don't talk a lot about, but these, these vehicles, uh, certainly the way they're constructed now, require geofencing, you know, they, they so you, you may start with a corridor where you allow these vehicles. But yeah, the, this transition, almost all the analysis is looking at the, the long future where everything's automated. This transition period is, is going to be challenging, to say the least. I like the uh, messy word, definitely. Okay, and then I guess um, Councillor Holliday touched on this, but my biggest concern, well, I think it sounds like it might actually improve road safety. There's potential it might, but we're not sure, it's speculation. So that's heartwarming to hear. But on the transit piece, um, it does worry me that we're, what we're doing with transit right now and uh, what we're actually spending money on related to road reconstruction or reconfigure, reconfiguring roads right now. I guess my, my issue is, um, do you ever, are you ever concerned we're spending money now, capital funds, that may change in a matter of five to ten years dramatically? There may be dramatic shifts in both transit and transportation in Toronto. I'm not, with, specifically with respect to the City of Toronto, I'm not very worried because I think, uh, particularly when we're talking about new radio lines like Relief Line and Smart Track into the downtown, from the suburbs to the downtown, as I was saying in my answer to Councilor Holiday, I, I think we're going to need those forever. And, and so I think the faster we can get that in place. Uh, maybe some of the Metrolink's investments in, in, in some more suburban lines, I, I, I suspect they're needed as well. I, I think the real issue with AVs is is your bus systems, um, and I and, and I think that's where you're going to see change, and that 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 could be cost effect that could improve service and 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 probably be much more cost effective than the current bus system. So and that, but that's not a high, in, in big high capital investment. I think road, road improvements. Uh, cars are going to still run on the roads. Uh, you know the Gardner Gardner East just to take a controversial example. Uh, 
autonomous vehicles are going to need it as well. So I think the, the notion that we're re rebuilding the Gardner was a good decision, a controversial one, good one, we're going to need it. So I'm not too worried about our capital investments. Uh, uh, I think it's more about uh, thinking about how transit in the suburbs might change. Okay, so, so just to be clear, you're more, most concerned about the bus systems or the most uh, transition maybe or change will be coming to the bus systems. Yeah. Um, and, and this new system in place down the road would be more reliable probably than the current. Yeah, well, I mean, one could imagine, and again, we want to do much more analysis and you know explore these things in, in more detail. But one could imagine the sort of minibuses picking people up at their door, taking you know getting you to the 905 uh, GO train station, you know, at, at 904, uh, you know, and and or for reverse commuting. You live downtown. You take you take the RER, the Smart Track, out to Unionville, and there's a you know a car there ready to take you to your office uh, office complex in the suburbs. Um, so I think I think we can really reimagine a, quite a different future for how people are accessing uh, transit and using transit in the suburbs uh, based on uh, autonomous vehicles. Okay, that's really infor informative. Thank you very much. I think those are all our questions. So thank you again. Uh, to our team from the University of Toronto Research Institute. It was a pleasure to have you here today. Very uh, interesting. And we're going to move back to committee and to questions of staff. So are there any questions for staff, either from their presentation or the report before us? Yes. Councillor Mamalady. I just want to know what staff would like us to do with this. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, staff has prepared this report and the information uh, to give you an update uh, and let you know what we are doing as a staff team in terms of uh, preparing for a lot of the questions that have been asked here today, engaging with all of the partners that we think are relevant within the city and external to the city, keeping our eyes on what's coming in the future so that we can be out ahead and not uh, go down a path where we uh, can't respond proactively to the challenges and benefits that automated vehicles will bring to us. So it's really a report for information to give you a status okay. update. Um, so, so have we touched base with our, with our unions and our uh, taxi industry and everyone else that are partners with us uh, to see what they're thinking? So that's our plan for 2018 is to have those broader conversations with stakeholders in the community. So our, our first work was to work internally, look at the existing council approved policies, plans, strategies build that tactical plan to kind of interpret how automation might relate to those and then have conversations in the community to understand the community's reaction, uh, what the community's thinking and their concerns around automation. And I also, just to add to that, Councillor, I think that um, we are learning from the, one of the reasons why it's so important that we have partnerships with other agencies and orders of government, both here and in the U.S., is because there's a lot of thought that's been given to impacts on employment, impacts on various job sectors. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and economic opportunities. There's been a lot of thought that's been given to that, and I would agree with you that we need to start engaging our partners now, even though many of these impacts won't be seen for, for a decade or more. Okay, thank you. To speak, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I've got you down. Um, other questions for staff? We'll ask one. Uh, we heard in one of the uh, deputations that, I think it was the first one, or, or maybe it was actually your presentation where the, your, some of the polling or some of the feedback has said that there's people who want to discourage AVs. What is the probability of discouraging AVs? I mean, is that even an uh, option? I think, uh, Madam Chair, that the, I mean, there's some comfort in the fact that um, that was a pretty small segment of the responses. I mean, I, I think AVs and automated uh, technology is here with us now in many of the safety features that we see in vehicles. Certainly, the industry is innovating on this. They're talking about it. They're taking action. They're testing. I, I, I think that um, our, our approach is to be as ready as we can and to help to shape that future for Toronto. 
Uh, and so we'll continue to test the public's um, opinion on this as we move forward, but I, but I do believe, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what they're interested in in terms of discouraging them, but I think it's more uh, some of the concerns that were raised and making sure that we're planning for that has, has been our approach. And then, um, uh, that's great, and the potential pilot, like down the road, I know we're, we're probably not ready for that, but, um, but actually, um, you know, that we've heard from the U University of Toronto how they're, they're being able, they're studying this via their uh, abilities and technologies and, um, you know, uh, what they, where they can within their, the context of uh, their work. But what about um, bringing that out onto the streets at some point? Would that be in the, in the next phase or the next stage where we would actually, I know there's other cities, Stratford's an example, I think, uh, in Ontario where you're seeing some of that happening. So what, what's the um, game plan for that? Uh, so, um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of other areas, both in the states and here, where they're inviting uh, some of those tests to take place on their streets. They're identifying locations uh, that various um, entities who have certain types of technology, whether it's freight technology or transit technology or um, individual personal vehicles, and they want to test them in various environments. I know uh, Los Angeles has, has taken some great steps there. Um, I think we'll continue to look for opportunities that make sense for Toronto about how we do that testing. Anything that we do, we would have to get um, a provincial authority to move forward with. Um, and right now we're involved in a, uh, a grant proposal with some partners to look at uh, testing or potentially what it would take to look at uh, an autonomous shuttle. So there's some, uh, there's certainly some things that are bubbling around there. We would certainly come back to council before we, we took any actions there. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions for staff. So we're gonna move to speakers and um, the first speaker is Councillor Mamalady. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I, um, I have two motions. Uh, they're just consultation motions just to ensure that uh, we get off uh, in consulting with our, 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 uh, our labor force and uh, the taxi industry. I think those two for now should, uh, should be secured. I'd like to know what they're thinking in terms of all of this. Um, and I hope you can support these motions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical about all of this only because I'm not in my 90s already and, and don't understand what's coming. Uh, and, and I can read into it to a degree and the skepticism that comes from me is how, how are we going to share the roads? Uh, right now, if you ask my opinion, I'd say uh, automated uh, vehicles only would enforce my view that roads should only be for vehicles, uh, for cars, uh, and 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 trucks, and not for cyclists, uh, because this is a, a prime example of where I can't see uh, how this is going to uh, this is going to help uh, our our equation uh, in getting people around without accidents and without congestion, because I can see. Automated vehicles, while they may not have accidents in the future, it doesn't mean they're not going to create the accidents. And if we continue wanting to use the road with every 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 form of everything, uh, I can see this being a problem. There are way too many people being too excited about this. I think um, I, I I would encourage them to take a step back uh, because uh, not only will this will this be a nightmare in costs for every single municipality and its infrastructure. Uh, but I, I, I honestly think that in, in large cities, uh, this is going to happen a lot later than anticipated. And if I were with the province right now, I'd be saying if there's any, any tests that are going to be done uh, outside of the universities, uh, then, and if you want to get out into communities, it should be the smallest uh, community in the province that might host some kind of a test with this to see whether or not, in fact, it could work before we talk about big cities. Here we are, the largest city in, in, in Canada, talking about uh, moving forward with a system like this, uh, and I think it's just going to create chaos uh, at the end of the day. And it'll be worse when you have drivers and carless or, or driverless vehicles 
uh, using the same, the same road. Uh, I think it's either one or the other. I, I don't think you can do both. That's just my opinion right now. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of this. Um, I think most of us are going to be right with, with our feelings about this. And then most of all, what is it that we have to do to prepare ourselves for the cost of all of this? Uh, because you just can't implement something like this overnight. And we're already talking about this happening in, in, uh, in another five or six years. And if it's going to be five or six years away, why aren't we budgeting for it here at the City of Toronto uh, if, if we don't know what we're doing around this yet? So I don't see it happening in, uh, in five or six years or seven years or eight years. I think it's going to be a lot longer. Even the, the first step that we were that we had, we had been, we'd been privy to seeing in this report, uh, I don't see how, how a city like ours is, is ready for this. Um, so, um, and then there's the, 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 the layoffs that, that, that this is gonna create. What are, we've already established that that's gonna happen. Uh, you know, what are we gonna do when our labor force fights back? Because that's gonna happen too. Uh, and is it, is, you know, which vehicles are going to are going to be automated and which ones aren't? Uh, are we looking at at our garbage trucks? And if so, uh, what do our what does local 416 have to say about that? We haven't even asked them yet. So I, I just don't see this happening in five or six years. Uh, I think it's going to be a long, lot longer. Councillor, thank you, Councillor Mamalady. Councillor Holiday. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did have a motion. It was very small. I just noticed in the um, the looking forward, the, the, the tactical plan, I just wanted to make sure that we included initiatives that reduce congestion and increase vehicle throughput. Those two particular ones weren't mentioned. It talked about um, information on congestion, but not actually reducing it. That's all it is. Thank you. Other speakers? Uh, Councillor Carmichael Greb. Um, this, is, this is something that's already here. We have to plan for it. The manufacturers have already started moving this way. Uh, we have adaptive cruise control. We have um, lane. My car can tell me if I'm leaving my lane without signaling. Um, we have pedestrian, um, pedestrian stopping. If someone walks in front of your car, your car will stop. Um, if we do not do this work now, the manufacturers are going to keep moving this way and we're going to be left behind and we will not be prepared. Uh, so the fact that we are doing this now is, is, is a good thing and we do not want to be left behind because we will be scrambling in five to ten years uh, because the manufacturers will be way beyond where they are now. So um, I'm fully supportive of, of this initiative. speakers, so I will take this opportunity to speak and thank uh, staff for a great report and a presentation today, as well as the University of Toronto for their excellent research and how they're collaborating with us so extensively. Uh, I do believe Toronto should be at the forefront of this. I think we are at the forefront, and I've got a series of motions I'd like to move. Some of them on behalf of the uh, University of Toronto Research Institute, the things that they feel are very important, and I I agree with them. So I'm, I'm starting off by just, um, staff mentioned 2019 as a report coming back. I'm asking for it to be in the first quarter, because I know that old trick as a former staffer. You say 2019 and then it's December. So we want to see that in the first quarter. Uh, so we can be proactive on this, uh, on this file. And I'd love to see specific recommendations and a detailed and comprehensive tactical plan. So uh, again, I, I, I think this is very exciting uh, because this is the very first time we've had um, a report of this nature before us. And it's, so it's in a sense, it's the very first time Council has um, discussed this important issue that's upon us. Um, I, I thought that the tactical plan could be more tactical, uh, although I know it's early days and so I'm hoping for something much more detailed and I'm sure that's the plan. Um, but I think staff have done an excellent job pulling all of this together and very detailed and informative. So again, I thank them for that. 
Um, also, on my, my second uh, point here is, um, as the University of Toronto identified, enhancing those partnerships with other levels of government and, and really, quite frankly, cities throughout the province and across Canada. Um, everybody's talking about this, but not um, really enough. And we need to make sure we're studying those best practices across the country. Uh, thirdly, just uh, was thinking about this yesterday, Sidewalk Lab. Sidewalk Labs and, and making sure we're working hand in hand with them because the, the two issues are closely linked. And so I, I wanted to include this. Uh, for the committee to consider and that we make sure that we're uh, collaborating and working with Sidewalk Lab. And the fourth item here is um, ensuring we take out a formal membership with the uh, Municipal Alliance for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. Um, and thank you for being here today very much. It was a great presentation and I think this is critical next step. And then lastly, uh, again, to try to force it on the agenda a bit. Uh, with FCM. I can't say I've ever attended FCM, but um, I think it's very important that municipalities uh, are collaborating, as I said earlier, and working on this across our beautiful nation and in all our cities across uh, Canada. So I thought we should encourage them to include this on their upcoming uh, annual conference on that agenda. So it's um, part and parcel of um, a proactive approach. I would just say uh, a few things in that, um, it, you know, we have to, it's quite frankly, it's less costly to prepare now uh, rather than retroactively. And that's often our problem. I often use the example of Uber, came out of nowhere. Uh, we were shell shocked. We continued to defer it. Um, we weren't ready for it. We weren't proactive. Our city staff did an excellent job facilitating it in the end, but um, I, I use that example simply because we need to be prepared. Councillor Carmichael Greb's done an excellent job, and I know why, because uh, there's uh, uh, in her family she has um, a lot of experience with cars, and so uh, I would say that I fully agree with her. It's upon us, it's happening, and we have to be ready. So I don't think there's any real options um, on this matter, and I, I'm happy to see Toronto being at the forefront, and I want to encourage city staff to continue to ensure that Toronto's at the forefront on this, on this issue, because um, it's very important. We're doing the data collection and the modelling. We're creating the regulatory frameworks and the plans and getting those all in place. Um, and so we can really be leaders on this file. And um, as Dr. Judy uh, has said to me before, you can't model what you can't measure. So uh, it's great we're leveraging the fantastic work uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, these research institutes. We're very, uh, very fortunate to have them in our city and to be able to collaborate and work with them. So again, I can't thank them enough. Um, and on that note, um, I will ask you to uh, support my motions uh, that I've placed. So the, uh, the clerk will assist me in um, facilitating these motions. So the first up is Councillor Mamalides, who's requesting consult consultation with uh, at least two parties there. Is he here? here. Well, we're moving your motion. Would you like to be here? Would, would you like to vote on it? Okay, great. Uh, all those in favor? All those in favor of the motion on the screen? Councillor Bamaliti, Councillor Peruzza, all those opposed? Councillor Carmichael Greb, Councillor Holliday, uh, Councillor Robinson, that motion fails. Okay, I know the next motion uh, will be put up on the screen. I'm assuming it's Councillor Holliday's, but we'll see, because he placed it second. Uh, this is to, um, I think Councillor Holliday saw this as a bit of a gap in the report, and so this is to look at uh, ways to reduce congestion and increase vehicle throughput uh, with part of the, as part of the tactical plan that will come forward in 2019. So all in favour? Opposed? That carries. Okay, and then the last mo set of motions are mine. Um, all in favour? Opposed? That carries. All right. Again, thank you, everybody, all the speakers today. That was really interesting. We're going to move on to our next item.
Um, and it's actually, I believe, our last item. Next item and last item. We have a number of deputations, and I understand from the committee that we have a motion um, that would like to be placed at this time. Uh, the motion is on the screen that speakers who have not pre-registered be allowed to register to speak until 11.15, um, and that the length of public presentations be limited to three minutes, and that questions of speakers by members of council be limited to three minutes with one round of question per member. Uh, if, this, if, we had, uh, if we had 100 people here, I'd understand uh, that we want to limit what they have to say to three minutes so that uh, everybody gets heard. But we don't have 100 people here, and I don't understand why we want to limit what they have to say. This is a really big issue that's come up uh, um, relatively fast with, uh, with very little consultation. And the only bit of consultation is that we're hearing here is from the community itself. And here we're telling them that instead of the five minutes that they're, they have the right to, 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 be, to be speaking, that they aren't, they're, they're cut to three minutes. Uh, and so I, I don't understand why we're doing this with only a few deputants and not hundreds. And I hope it's not an attempt to stifle what people have to say. Your hand? Oh, okay. So the motion's before us. Councillor Lee, I don't know if you saw this motion, but that's been uh, put forward. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Okay, um, so we're going to start. We're we're going to start with the speakers, and then proceed to staff questions, and uh, then speakers from the committee. So that will be the order for this item. Uh, this item is PW 26.6, just so everybody's in the loop, reimagining Young, Shepherd to Finch, Municipal Class, EA study, Environmental Assessment Study. Our first speaker on the list is Patricia Starr. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Is it there? That is there. And there's a little um, button you pushed so your microphone turns on. Make sure it's on. And you can start whenever you are ready. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on Reimagining Young Street. I am part of a volunteer team of Willowdale residents that include MTCC Condo Corps presidents, representing over 8,000 Willowdale residents, board members and residents from over 22 condos. Our leader is former councillor and police board chair Norm Gardner, who was out of town. He has asked me to speak in his stead. I am the former Vice Chair of the Committee of Adjustment and the former Chair of Ontario Place. All the comments in this report are documented. Any conversations will be confirmed in person when required. The fun and delight that was once Bloor Street is dead. King Street is suffering a slow and painful death. We are trying to save Young Street from the same fate. Since so many in Willowdale are seniors, we hope that you will hear our cries. Most of us were unaware of reimagining Young Street until June 2017. Somehow the notices of 2016 got lost in the mail, except the mail of those supporting turning Young Street into biker lane heaven. In June, we attended an open forum organized by Councillor Philly and staff, led by his EA who was announced as a former Ontario Liberal Party employee and a good friend of Kathleen Wynne and David Zimmer. Was that supposed to matter? When Norm Gardner reported that he had personally met with the EMS, police and fire departments, who were very concerned, staff replied, and I quote, they were going to do some research. When another one of our group asked if the Korean and Iranian restaurant owners and retailers, over 150 establishments between the 401 and Finch, had been consulted, the staff answer was, and I quote, the city will be following up. 18 months later, what were they doing the entire first year? When asked if there would be a translator, it was a two-person response. The city staffer said, and I quote, we will make arrangements, followed by another staffer who said, Canada has two official languages, English and French. That is all city employees are required to speak. There were some boos. I have personally met 
with members of the Willowdale Korean Association and the Iranian community. Outrage was expressed when they were never consulted before the fact. Their communities are against bike lanes on Yonge Street that they call, and I quote, the bankruptcy of their livelihoods. They had never heard from Fillion or his staff. Most didn't even know who he looked, what he looked like. It was time for us to find out point, point the proponents order, of the point bike of lanes uh, on Yonge Street and who John Fillion really was. Pardon of order. Yeah. I, I think, and, and, and if he's interrupting, Mrs. is this Mrs. counting Starr, on my time? Mrs. Starr would know this, given that she was the chair of Ontario Place, the vice chair of the Com uh, Committee of Adjustment, uh, that when you appear before, uh, before a committee like this, a little decorum, he's Councillor Fillion. He's not just Fillion, he's Councillor Fillion. A little respect would go a long way. Really? Okay, no, when I'm we sorry. discovered that council... I have a personal privilege. Everybody knows what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know. When we discovered that Councillor Fillion was running an ESL school along with rental opportunities out of his renovated home on Parkview Avenue, directly in association with Katz, yep, Oban, just one moment, Trigel, please. You know, it's just, you can't yep. The... I'll allow her to point of order. speak, but the time is just about up, so if I can ask you point to wrap of order. up, I'll give you a few extra, okay, point of order. Let's make it perfectly clear, Councillor Fillion doesn't sit on the committee and can't interject. Thank you. I, I understand that uh, the speaker is speaking about Councillor Fillion. I'll allow the comment to come in, but I will ask to wrap up because we are approaching the limit on time. We're actually over. I'll give, you, I'll give you a few extra Katz, seconds. Association with Katz, and Tridell, developers on Yonge Street, we were shocked. Building permits, renovation plans, couldn't find them. Is that allowed? To the letter. George Belza works for Mancus. He is the person to whom two of our members were told by Councillor Fillion to speak to when they asked him I'll ask you about to wrap their own up, development please. projects. I don't know why you're doing this. This is, not, this is not the way it is. In fact, we could protest. Why you allowed people to, th these people spoke 10 minutes each and now you're cutting us off. We voted Do for I three point? minutes. If I can ask you to wrap up, please. Do you have any closing comments? Um, let's see. Yes, we are. We we have uh, challenged the opinion of the city, who's claiming that reimagining Young Street should be contacted uh, by the. We should contact the integrity commissioner. We being the residents of Willowdale. Now, all of this that I have. Okay, I have to ask that you. Uh, you have deliberately. I up. want to be on record. You have deliberately cut us okay. off. Thank you very much. Because you don't want us to be able to do. I'm not sure you're allowed to do this, so we are going to file yep. protest. And of course, the media has all of this. Thank you very much. So. Oh, Councillor Mamaliti, you have a question? Sure. I, I, I tried to to stop them from from. Well, we knew they were. We knew ahead of time. Uh, but but at the end of the at the end of the day, you've made some 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 pretty interesting comments I'm just trying to it's all documented to to relate it to what we're talking about um, are you suggesting that that cats goldben tridell belza menkes are related to what's going on right now with this new plan well what the question we raised with the city was we believe that councillor fillion is not appropriate to be doing any zoning in willowdale and this is the backup. Therefore, he is the one behind the Young Street bike lanes. That's zoning. Okay. If he, we feel I, that I'm going to warn everyone to stick to the material of the report and not drift into other areas. Okay. So was there, was there uh, uh, ample consultation during last election on this, or did this just come out of the blue? We didn't know anything till June 2017, which is when Mr. Gardner and the group stood on, on uh, Clover uh, Greenfield Avenue and said, what is this all about? Were there debates on whether or not Young Street should be closed off the way it is during the last election? No, not that we knew. Do we were not informed of anything until we received a flyer in June of 2017. And if you are checking your uh, records, the staff person, a lovely staff lady, has copies of our emails instantly in June 8th saying do, what's do, going do, on, what's do, going Do you know where we're going to get this, the, the, the millions of dollars, the tens of millions of dollars to build this out? Has we asked Councillor Philly and, and his staff would not respond. Do, 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 do you believe that there should be some, at least an election 
to determine whether or not people really want this in absolutely. their community? Absolutely, absolutely. Do you, do you feel like this is being rushed through for something? Being railroaded, and we are concerned that Councillor Fillion's association with certain developers, including Belza, all documented, and Mancus, should preclude him even sitting on not only this committee, any zoning committee, and in city council. We okay. have asked the so, mayor to pursue it. Uh, chair, thank on you. a point of order, I would ask the chair. Like, really, like I would ask the, the chair. Thank you. I'm going to remind one final time yeah, to like stick to the to the. Thank you. Please but, stick to the subject matter of the report. But if you have issues with the councillor, there are other avenues for that. Please don't use this forum. Well, if they've asked me a question, I'd like to answer it. Please stick to the report. Well, you do have a responsibility for that. Do I not answer the question? That's okay. You tell me. I don't. Mr. I'm Mr. Chairman, my my question was was relevant to this particular project itself. I'd asked whether or not all these people were actually involved with this at all, and and you got the answer, right? Thank you. Are there any further questions, Councillor Mamaliti? <laughs> Thank you. No. Do I get up or nope. do I wait? Just a moment, please, Councillor Carmichael Greb. Thank you. So we have a couple different options that we are looking at in this report. Is your group concerned with the consultation and report as a whole, or are you okay with looking at um, uh, upgrading Young Street, wider sidewalks, cleaning up sidewalks, cleaning up the road, all of those parts other than the bike lanes? Yes, we are. We are against the bike lanes, and we are now, based on all the work we've done, very, very concerned about the representative, and we are pursuing it at another level. Okay. And what about the other options that are available, putting bike lanes on Beecroft, um, those options? Are you, what is your group's... We are not... Those? I can't speak for everyone, but we are, well, sort of. Beecroft is... There's nothing on Beecroft. And when anybody tells you that it will cost 10 times more than doing Young Street, they're fibbing. It will not cost 10 times more. Beecroft is an empty, plain street. There's nothing doing. There's a, there's a cemetery. There's a, things on you. So why not Beecroft? We aren't opposed. We aren't in favor. We're ready to listen. But it's not true when you get an insane quote about what it will cost to put bike lanes on Beecroft. It just isn't true. Am I allowed to get up or do I wait? <laughs> Another question for you, it's Councillor Peruzza. Yeah, would it be fair to say that you came here, uh, other than saying that you don't like or you're against bike lanes, you've offered no advice, uh, no opinion, uh, no information whatsoever on why bike lanes are good or bad on Young Street, why transform Young Street would either be good or bad from an finish. urban perspective. You did finish, you no. said a lot. Other than your, your other than your, uh, uh, other than your very strong objections five related minutes. to your local council. You took council, two minutes away. You offered nothing else. Excuse me if you looked, I'm... Nothing. Excuse me, it is all documented, attached, it was sent, the specifics of Mr. Cohen, of Mr. Musavi, and Norm Gardner, which was part of my report. You didn't even let me finish my report, in which I was going to refer to the wonderful late Esther Shiner and her scrawny son, who I'm happy to see sitting over there, <laughs> and how much fun we had tormenting Mel Lastman about his funny bunny shepherd subway. But you cut me off, so I can't tell you all my nice comments. Th thank you so much for the past 15 minutes. Welcome. They've been so enlightening. Okay, I think we're done. Is that it? I'm getting up? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to move on to our next speaker, and the next speaker is David Cohen. Welcome, David. Thank you, Councillor, and um, thank you for um, hearing me this morning. I'll try to be brief. Um, I oppose the reimagining Young Street's conclusions. Um, I would consider uh, the Beecroft. I live at 57 Tobruk, which is in Councillor Shiner's ward immediately north of um, this area. I believe we are um, grossly affected from a transportation perspective. Um, I'm a longtime former resident of York Region. Uh, when I moved to Tobruk, my car insurance uh, went up by $800 because of the postal code, your uh, website said 
that uh, this is the highest accident uh, area in the city of Toronto at um, Bishop, and yet no studies were done before the putting this in and talking to people. Um, I'm concerned about where the traffic goes, if it's going on my street or my neighbor's street, because it won't come here. You're pretending that there's nobody coming uh, from north of my ward, uh, and you're assuming that residents in my ward will continue to shop in North York when there's no parking on the street, when uh, we can go to Nor when we can go to York Regent and park for free and not have to deal with this. So um, I feel that uh, this is really wrong. It's unsafe. Um, I do agree with many things Councillor, former Councillor Gardner said, including that it's taking away $3 million a year in parking fees. That would have, over 10 years, paid for the increase in, um, in, in going to Beecroft. I think that um, you first need to address the traffic issues as they regard to safety in the area and then deal with this issue. And I'm appalled at the fact that, th that, that those traffic issues are out of the way simply because it's politically expedient to have bicycles here, whether or not it's safe or not, or whether uh, I and my family are safe in our community. Anyways, I thank you very much. Um. Okay, so thank you. We have questions for you. So first up is Councillor Mamalady. So, so the way this thing came about was uh, that the city was about to venture into uh, spending some money on Young Street to resurface and to make sure that it's safe for people that use it. And from there, it became a massive undertaking uh, to, to, to block traffic uh, with, with the lanes and now it's become even bigger venture by saying, okay, well, if you don't like it on, on Young Street, well, let's use Beecroft. Uh, my biggest concern here is it's happened over the last little while without going through an election. How does the community feel about this being driven uh, so fast without proper, a proper for, uh, democratic form for that matter, uh, and whether or not a councillor should be ramming this through? What I'd say, and I, I can only talk for the area that I live in, is uh, people don't, even if you were to say we're going to put bicycle lanes in, I don't pe think people have been told what the ramifications are that cars are going to come into their streets. Instead, I think they assume you as council understand and would protect them, and therefore, I don't think that it's really been discussed. Uh, Do you and think I noticed it? Um, I noticed it just after I moved to Toronto. Do you think a, an election might be the way to do this? Uh, well, an election would certainly help r r raise uh, so, raise so awareness. So, if Councillor Fillion wants to to bring this through, shouldn't he be asking his community through an election? Uh, to give him the the blessing as a councillor to do it, as opposed to taking uh, a, a road that was going to be resurfaced well, and I'm then spending hundreds of millions of dollars on it after that? Well, yes, and also, we had a meeting on December something, uh, somebody here can say, public meeting on the subject, and we're now January. Um, papers were handed out for us to fill out. They didn't ask us if we didn't like it. They only want, the, the papers only wanted us to give suggestions on Im, improvements. And with this meeting being called so quickly thereafter, uh, and with the many people who were there, how could this report have been written by your staff through Christmas and approved? And I don't know why I know these processes, but I do. Um, and, um, and be here right now. They weren't listening. I'm not sure that the people doing the study are listening. They're, I think. This was this honest, I think it's a. It's this is a foregone conclusion. Was this even debated last election in the community? I didn't live in uh, this ward in the last election. Okay, I'll ask somebody else. Councillor Mamalidi, your time's up. Councillor Lee is next. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, David Cohen is a former city, uh, city councillor in the uh, town of Richmond Hill. So welcome to uh, Toronto, yeah. and welcome for moving on to Toronto. <laughs> and uh, now, you mentioned that you're against the bike lanes. Are you against uh, changing, uh, re-imaging Young Street uh, to leave yes. the six lanes, each, I mean, uh, three lanes each way? Uh, Councillor uh, Lee, thank you for your welcome. Um, I'm, when you say I'm against the bike lanes, what I'm against is not dealing with the uh, safety issues and car issues on Young Street, and I believe they preclude getting to the point of talking about bikes. So I'm in favor of having bikes in a safe place, and I'm in favor of cars driving in a safe place, and I'm opposed to cars going down uh, Northwood and Wedgwood and many other of these streets in my neighborhood in lieu of the fact that they're going to be blocked at Finch. Now, you know there is a different option of putting uh, bike lanes on Beecroft. Uh, I think it's a good that? idea because it's not on Young Street. Okay. Uh, are you also aware that I heard that uh, York Region is uh, putting bike lanes on Young Street north of Steeles? Have you heard that? Um, I haven't paid any attention recently okay. to, to it, but I would expect that my opinion would be based on reviewing what they were doing before commenting whether I support it or not. The issue of whether bicycles can ride on the street also must be weighed on whether or not there's safety and what happens to the cars that you remove. So if you show me appropriate plans that show me where the cars are going to go, um, it's not that I have an issue against bicycles, but rather I have an issue that I want to feel safe and my neighbors want to feel safe. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another question for you, uh, Councillor Holliday. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, so you're familiar with Richmond Hill, obviously. Uh, would you, can you describe to me, because I don't, I live west, not north, of the importance of Young Street as a connector within the regional network. Do you, do you think, you know, the- Young Street is the, um, is considered in Richmond Hill, and I would have thought in Toronto, as being a highway, Highway 11, that it's the main street, the main commercial street, the main north-south uh, street in Richmond Hill. And at the end of the day, I was a counselor for 22 years, everything flows from Young Street, along Young Street, it, both in traffic, the money that you spend on transit, all flows up and down Young Street. Um, generally speaking, a lot of offices and jobs and um, people all flow up and down Young Street, so one would expect you'd want traffic to move on Young Street. Is the connection to Highway 401 important? And I, I'm thinking about the people of the North Toronto, but even people above Steeles Avenue. Yes, it is. And, and, and if, um, even people north of Finch like to use uh, the 401. Um, um, in my understanding was at the time the 407 was built that it was a relief highway for Highway 401. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why one might be using 401 at various times if you live in New York region, um, among which you may not want to always pay uh, fees for using Highway 407. One final question. Um, you're a former councillor, so that means uh, you made a profession of staying in tune with the sentiment of the community. Would you say that the sentiment of the community is uh, is in opposition or is leery of this proposal? I think that was the essence. And would you say that the community is fairly unified in that view? And more so, is there a difference between the people that may live right on Young Street versus in the neighborhood behind? I don't want to give of an impression that I was a counselor in Toronto. Of course. And that um, I know substantive people in Toronto. What I would say is I haven't heard anybody expressing excitement about it. Um, I think a lot of people in my neighborhood are concerned that the area up to Finch has ring roads and 
other means of permitting higher density buildings and higher density buildings are being applied for along Young Street uh, towards where we are and there doesn't seem to be any transportate traffic way of dealing with it with the same um, a complexity of, of, of what's been approved south of us, south of Bishop, in fact. Um, um, at, um, a couple, there's just, there's just no road plan, there's just no traffic plan that way, which, which is why I guess I'm here today because my purpose is not to become a Toronto politician. Okay, Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, well, thank you, David, for being here. Just a couple questions. So do, do you live in Ward 23 where this is being proposed? No, I live in the ward immediately north, Councillor Shiner's ward. Oh, okay. So in Ward 24. So do you know the, the neighbourhood of Willowdale around Young, do you have a sense of what the population is within walking distance of Young Street? Do, do, you, do, you have a, do you know by chance? If you don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, I never gave it any thought. Uh, all right. Um, so I understand it's somewhere in the range of 100,000 or 80,000. Um, you described Young Street as considered a highway. So I guess the question is, do you think it's safe to have a highway running through a neighborhood of around 80,000 people? Okay, I learned, I learned in, an engine, in, in, in an engineering sense that you have different levels of roadways. Uh, the councillor was asking about um, at the highest level, of course, you have highway, and it says Highway 11 along Young Street, so I'm not without that. However, I could say that it's a metro road. So, and, and by being a metro road counselor, I would then immediately say that metro roads are supposed to be thinking beyond the local area and providing movement of cars and commerce and everything um, for some distance, so, so I, I and this would not, this road would not be looked at like you're describing as a local area road. So, but I just want to come back to the, the question, which is you described Young Street as being considered a highway from your time as a councillor in Richmond Hill. And so specifically, the question specifically, yes. sir, if, if I could finish, yeah. please, sir, specifically is given that for many north of the city, the consideration as young as a highway, as you've described, do you consider it safe to have something operating like a highway running through a neighborhood? Safety. Do you consider having something like a highway running through a neighborhood safe? Um, do I consider it safe? I've just told you that I think that Young Street is unsafe, whether it's a highway, a roadway, a, a a pathway, it's unsafe at the moment. And would so, so I it's can turn around and tell you the opposite, or I would be hypocritical. Oh. However, you have signed up, um, and you represent the city, saying that this is Highway 11 in the city of Toronto, and so I have to be, I'm entitled to call it a highway. Obviously, it's not a highway in the same sense, and by the way. Sir, I, I have, my time is almost up. So you just described Young Street as being unsafe. So the question is, would maintaining six lanes of traffic continue its unsafe patterns or make it better? Well, what do you propose to do instead? Because I don't think. Thank you very city, much. You, yeah. Okay, time's up. Um, I think that's all our questions. Oh, Councillor uh, David Shiner has a question for you. Well, David's my Maybe. constituent, so David, nearest what intersection do you live? Um, Wedgwood and uh, Young. So you're very, so you're just north of the bus terminal? Yeah, I'm just north of, I'm just, just north, north of Cummer. Cummer. Just north of the bus terminal. We're gonna yeah. be here for a while. And this proposal is supposed to go north of Finch into Ward 24? Yes. So you're looking for your counselor to no. deal with? which is me, to be the scrawny one over here. <laughs> I'm not looking. Well, you're possible. looking for your counselor to also be involved in the decision-making process of this? Yes. Okay. In regards to metro roads, local roads, is University Avenue Highway 11A? Maybe. Isn't it six lanes? Yes. Doesn't it run through the heart of the city? Yes. 
So your concerns might be justified about having a major roadway run through the middle of a residential or a community. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is actually Better, a It's eight lanes, not six. So it's Thank you, David, very much for being here today. Appreciate your time. We're going to move on to our next speaker, and that is Gil Penalosa, 880 Cities. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Sure, your mic's on, is it? Hello. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. You can okay. go ahead. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me here. I think that the staff has done a really, really good report. Uh, I think that, uh, and the staff has analyzed many issues. Uh, I've heard a lot of the questions. I think there, I've heard one, one topic, one couple of words repeated too often, the community. You live in the community, the community. This is not a community project. This is a citywide project. This is a magnificent opportunity to help transform the city in a city from, for cars into a city for people. This uh, is uh, probably in a once in a generation or two generations opportunity to do it. I think that when we're talking about small streets within a neighborhood, it's a neighborhood issue. When we're talking about Young Street, we need to listen to everybody in the city, to the wider community, because it's going to have an impact on everybody. I also um, want to mention that what we're talking about, so I, I want to complement the staff report, uh, because this is not about mobility. This is about democracy. This is about sustainability. This is about economic development. When I talk about democracy, I'm talking is because this is the streets are public space. If we look at Toronto from the air, 30% of our city are streets. And the streets belong to everybody. Whether you have a car or not, whether you walk or not, or bike or whatever, they belong to everybody. Young, old, rich, poor, fat, skinny, everybody. Uh, and by the way, walking and cycling is not a frivolity. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility of most people. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility of every child and youth in Toronto, of everybody. If you're under 16, your only individual mode of mobility is to walk or bike. So doing it safe and enjoyable should be almost like a human right, unless you think that only the people that have the age and the money and the desire to drive a car have a right to individual mobility. So I think that this Reimagine Young has to do with creating a better city for all. This is about the environment, about having less noise and less pollution. It's about economic activity. It's about also transportation, but also about health. We are living longer. We are getting older. And some of the main issues of the older adults are mobility and isolation. And I think Reimagine Young Street in, in a big part touches on both and improves it's going to improve the physical health, it's going to improve the mental health, and it's going to improve the well-being of everybody. So I strongly support that they reimagine Young Street in order to create a, a better city for everyone, not just a better neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming down. Uh, do you live in the area, sir? No. Uh, okay. So you're not a resident in, in that ward? No, that's why I made an emphasis that when you talk about an issue on Young Street, it's a, big so issue. A, a, a big issue, it's not a world issue. We cannot manage our city so you, like if these were 44 banana republics that I, I let you do whatever you want in your, you, you in your world as long as you let me do whatever I want in mine. This is a citywide you issue. You would suggest that, that local communities have nothing to say about this? No, that they do have to say right, as well as everybody else. And if they do... How do you explain that it, has, it wasn't even talked about in last election? Well, last election was three years ago. Things happen in between elections. Do you not, do you understand that the city is also going through a, a change with respect to representation and that particular ward is being chopped up? Do you but, not think that uh, it's an election year now? That, that if it's such a big issue for everybody, that the community have an opportunity to debate it during an election to see whether or not uh, their representatives should actually bring this forward or not. 
In the elections, you talk about big projects, big policies, not about specific individual projects. So because it wasn't talked about last election, and you have a, uh, a very uh, excited councillor that wants to ram this through, uh, you think that that's democracy? Well, we, we are, we're going to grow by 50% of the population in the next 25 years. We cannot wait for every decision four years to go into the details. So instead of, instead of a resurfacing and allowing this community to enjoy a better road with the resurfacing that was going to cost us already budgeted $24 million along Young Street, because the local councillor has taken this on immediately, now it's ballooned to a cost of about $150 million, including Beecroft. We just heard Do you that not think that the local community should have a say in an election with respect to this kind of balloon and cost as well? I don't think that detailed decisions are what happens in, 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 in a citywide election. But anyway, I do think that we need to listen. And when we hear that over 100,000 people live next door and there's children, and there's older adults. But we've I, I want to remind but we've taken you. care of that yeah. we, because now, you know, now the you? city of Toronto is now increasing the amount of councillors. And in this area, it's going to be chopped up. You're going to have uh, the, the councillors that, that people want in this area. Don't you think that, that if, if there's a time to debate this thing, it would be at, a, at an opportune time where this ward is being chopped up? In the, election, in the past election, every councillor talked about making the city safer for people walking. And a person walking in Toronto gets hit by a car every three and a half hours. Every three, 24, 365 days of the year. A person riding a bicycle gets hit by a person driving every seven hours. So I heard in the last election and the one before and before and before that all councillors wanted to make a city safer for people and walking outside. And a taxpayer gets hit continually by, by, by making decisions like this on a regular okay, basis. So the taxpayer gets hit too. Okay, Councillor Holliday has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The previous speaker talked about the importance of Young Street as part of the regional transportation system to move people around, maybe even connect people to the expressway. Do you agree that um, the proposed changes to reduce from six lanes to four lanes will increase travel times for people? It might increase travel times for people driving. It will not increase travel times for people in public transit. It will not increase travel times for people walking. It will not increase travel times for people riding bicycles. So they'll stay the same. Okay, so for the people driving, there's a lot. There's tens of thousands of them. Do you not agree that it's a problem to increase travel times? Well, what I do know is that we already have huge traffic jams. We just heard a couple of hours right. on automated vehicles. You know, what makes, travel, uh, uh, what makes the traffic jams are not, are not the people driving, are the vehicles, are the cars. So whether those cars have someone driving or not is going to be huge. We're going to have a million more people. So we're going to have hundreds of thousands more cars. So unless we have a city for people, that people can actually get to places walking, or cycling or using public transit, we are not going to have a, a great city for everyone. But you agree, though, that there are traffic jams. So do you not think it's logical to maintain capacity of roads or increase capacity of roads rather than decrease them? Because that will exacerbate the problem. Not really. I think that if we create a city where people can actually walk to, the children, my organization is called 880 Cities. 880 Cities is a simple but powerful concept. What if everything we did in our city had to be great for an 8-year-old and for an 80-year-old? Then it would be good for everybody. That includes the crosswalk and the sidewalk and the street and the park and the public space. We need to stop building the city as if everyone was 30-year-old and athletic. And let's create a Toronto for everyone. Would you agree, though, that making travel time is more difficult for the tens of thousands of people that drive does have a health effect? It has a mental health effect. It has a stress effect. It has a quality of life effect. It, it affects people in terms of the amount of family time that they have. And it, this may be one initiative, but you start to compound these with all of the other initiatives, 
we're really making a health hit on people by introducing congestion. You know, there is no city in the world the size of Toronto, and I have worked in over 300 different cities. There is no city the size of Toronto that have solved the issue of mobility through the private car. None. If that was an option, we would have hundreds of examples. We don't have any. So the reality is that we need to invest heavily in public transit citywide, not one stop subways, but citywide. And we need to invest in having a city that is walkable and that is bikeable, because through the car, that's not going to be a solution. It has not been, and it will not be. And, it, and things are going to get worse as we increase the population. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, just to, just to uh, bring the visiting counselors up to speed, how PWIC, how we do it at PWIC is we have the visiting counselors ask questions first and then speak first. And so just, I know there's some new members here that haven't been here before. So we'll be, we'll accommodate it this time, but just in the future, if you could uh, get your hand up, that'd be great. Councillor Cressy. Uh, well, thank you, Gil. Just two brief questions. First, have you reviewed the Reimagine Young Design options? Have you looked at them? Yes. Okay. Um, based on your professional opinion, somebody who's worked in more than 300 cities with a focus on safety, which is the safest option for, as you put it, eight-year-olds and 80-year-olds? Oh, by far, the reimagined youngster it is, is the safest option for everybody. Okay. And should you describe Young Street as a citywide issue? So my question would be, should Young Street be designed to move people or to move people safely? obviously to move people safely and citywide and the whole city, every single project, we should take advantage of every single opportunity in the city to move in that direction. It's not just about approving policies, oh, we have vision zero, but when we have the opportunity to actually put vision zero into practice, then we start questioning. This is a great example to be consistent between what we think, what we say, and what we do. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Gil, thank you very much. We're going to move on to thank our you. next speaker. It's Mike Uford. It's Ufford. No. Oh, Ufford, I'm sorry. My apologies. Oh, that's the usual so, mistake. I'm, right. seven, I'm 74, by the way. <laughs> Look great. I'm not 8 or 80. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my comments. Uh, I'm here today because I'm... I so often hear city, civic leaders uh, inveigh against Toronto's traffic congestion, and yet it seems like every project that comes forward does nothing but make congestion worse. And I think that's the case with this proposal as well. I don't live in North York, but as the uh, previous uh, deputant indicated, I think that uh, it's a this matter is a citywide issue, or maybe even larger. Uh, Young Street really belongs to everybody in, in, the, in, in, in Toronto. From its construction in the 1700s until today, it's been a, it's seen as a key element in the city's and even Ontario's transportation infrastructure. And I think transportation planners now refer to this type of street either as a metro road in, in the Toronto parlance or an arterial road. When I go to my annual physical exam, my doctor always checks my cholesterol levels to prevent clogged arteries. The city needs to guard against narrowing its arteries as well, in my opinion. Um, and it, I, I, I found the previous uh, item very interesting to sit through the discussion on AV, and it seems like while it's difficult to understand, to predict the future, automotive vehicles will, it's very likely that they will even improve, uh, increase uh, usage of the streets. Bike lanes, on the other hand, are great. I like bike lanes. The problem is that city, uh, that cycling activists always insist that the lanes go in the area where they would do the most disruption. Uh, when I drive my car to North York Center, I always park in the peripheral green P lots on, 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 on um, um, Beecroft, and I walk the short distance to Young Street. Why can't bicyclists do the same thing? They are a lot, a lot better physical shape than I am. Fortunately, there is an option for this, and it's the bike lanes on Beecroft option B, or what, whatever, uh, it's not called option B. Uh, and I thank the committee, I think it was this committee that actually initiated that kind of discussion about 
about keeping uh, the artery open and, and accommodating the bike lanes on Beecroft. Um, finally, I would say that I've heard Councillor Fillion talk about recreating a Main Street character of North York and, and decrying the fact that there's a highway that's going through a high-rise neighborhood. The preferred, preferred, uh, preferred vision seems to be more like the Danforth or Yorkville. But I think that pl good planning doesn't try to transform an area into something that's like something another, another place, but to build on the strengths and the characters of the local area. And, and uh, go ahead, put the, uh, uh, improve the pedestrian realm. Uh, but, and put bike lanes in the area where they won't disrupt traffic. One last point is that people talk about highways through cities. There are countless examples, University Avenue was mentioned, of heavily trafficked roadways in urban areas. The Champs-Élysées Champs is a very, is one example. Uh, a famous one that it's not a problem uh, in, in Paris. Park Avenue in, in, in Manhattan is another example. Wrap up. Sorry? You'll have to wrap up. I'm, I'm wrapping up. Uh, that basically is my presentation. I'm guessing you're going to have a question, so you'll have a bit more time. Councillor Mamalady's got one for you. Uh, is there any visiting councillors? No. So we're going to go to our committee. Sir, how long have you lived in the area? I don't live in the area. You don't? I live in Paula Fletcher's ward. You live in Paula Fletcher's work. I do. And, and how do you feel about the, the particular project that's being discussed? The reimagining Young Street? Yeah. Do you, would you like to see this go through? I, I support the uh, bike lane on Beecroft, keeping the uh, capacity of Young Street. Okay, so y you would rather uh, use a different option? Yes. Would you? Would well, you, I think it's an option that has been before the committee, and as a matter of fact, it was you, discussed by the uh, by the, you, the staff as as one of the two options under discussion. Would you, in your own community, uh, accept a project, a resurfacing project, turning into a, a very large project, without it being talked about in a, in an election? Don't you, wouldn't you want to say if, if your community was going to change drastically in an election to see whether or not you'd want to give the mandate to the, the local councillor to push it? I, I'm, I, I, councillor, I, I I'm not too excited about, it, about that in an election. I would, see, I would like to see broad community consultation. As a matter of fact, Danforth Avenue is in, in my area, and I am really concerned about some of the proposals I'm hearing about putting bike lanes and, 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 and congesting the arteries on the, on the Danforth as well. But would you rather, would you, would you want your local councillor just overnight decide that that's what's best for you without, without talking about it and whether or not uh, his, his view is actually the view of your local community or her view for that matter? Well, I certainly, as I said, would like wide consultation. I don't know whether there has been wide consultation or not. People that I have been talking to said that it hasn't been. Other people have said it has been. Uh, but um, Have you been to many of Paula Fletcher's meetings? I go Council to some Fletcher's of them, meetings? yes. Is there translation at those meetings at times? Yes. Would it be shocking to learn that there was no translation for the Korean community or, or other communities? It would be a problem for me, yes. So the local councillor who seems to run a, an, an ESL pro, uh, program out of his home uh, is even not wanting to, yeah, to give, Councilor Mamalady, uh, that's not to give an order. opportunity yeah. for people order. to, uh, Chair, yeah. to, allegations uh, to against have fellow councillors that are unfounded yeah. should be censured. Yeah, so you're, yeah, it's a we're point well aware. Order. Councillor Mamalady, would you retract I, those I get it. The left have been running this, this administration for quite some time now, so just, just blurting out the way they do is, is yeah. acceptable, I guess. I can declare a member of point of order. When a fellow councillor makes an allegation unfounded against another member of this chamber, I rise on a point of order. Madam Chair, I ask you to rule on it. Yeah. So, 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 Madam Chair, yeah, I am yeah. a member of the committee. Yeah. And Really, we need a little decorum. We need to be able to respect each other a little more than that. And just simply kind of, you know, sort of, you know, 
calling people by their acronyms, uh, uh, referring to people in, in, in the form of slight, making things up and, and just saying stuff because you feel like saying it without any basis. That's not, that's not, that's not a respectful yeah, way for just, us to treat just, each other. So let me just, I would let just look me, to you just, for some yeah. guidance. Let me just that. change, uh, let me change the wording. Um, uh, uh, there was a deputation. It, uh, there, were, there were suggestions made that there was an ESL program running out of Council Fillion's home. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, it, it, I should have said the the potential for it, or or possibly, or you know, something like that. You, I think so. I'll change. I'll change the tone. The of The committee that. would like you to retract your comment. I just did. I just did. Well, you said you were going to use different language. I did. Your I, 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 I just I'd like did. You to retract your comments. Well, I'm not going to retract them completely because I don't know whether or not he is or not. But if he is, if this is accurate, and he's running an ESL program out of his house. It's shocking that, no. that there wasn't okay. any translation so now you're given just in this community. Yourself uh, in deeper. So if you could just retract your comment, because it's not appropriate. I'll, I'll retract it for now. Can I add something to my answer? Ma Madam Chairman, well, may I add a, something minute, to my answer? I'm not answer? sure where we're at. So you were going to answer uh, Councillor Mamalady's well, question? The, yeah, well, the question was how much consultation, okay. local Thank consultation should be uh, made. And it, this is not my area of expertise. But mm -hmm. let me say this. Uh, even if there was a lot of consultation, and even if a local area decided 100% or very high that they wanted to do something that was bad for the city, I, that would, I wouldn't support that no matter how much consultation there was. Okay, thank you. Other questions for um, the deputant? I guess I just have a, I, I'm just curious. You made a big effort to come today. Yes. Um, you don't live in the area, you live in Councillor Fletcher's ward, so we know that area of the city. So what was your, what was your main rationale or reason for for joining us today, is it capacity, road capacity? Is that what you're? Yes, I, I, I believe that. Congestion as I said, at the or congestion and gridlock and road capacity, or yes, what's exactly. Your experience I, as a I, uh, I believe that a city needs to be balanced, and it can't go all in the favor of of of, of car traffic or all in favor of of bike bicycle traffic, and and. Um, uh, I've just heard time and time again on the radio and in the newspaper about city council say, saying, oh, this is terrible, this traffic is just awful and it's unbearable, it's worse than Los Angeles. And yet everything that comes through, Dan, the, Dan, uh, the Bloor Street bike lanes, uh, the, the council came within three votes of, of tearing down the Gardner Expressway and replacing it with a lovely boulevard. Uh, uh, I, this just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, you can't fight congestion and then create it at the same time. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Holliday has a question for you as well. I guess at City Council, we, we, we see these from time. We see them in Community Council, we see them here at Peewick, we see them at Council. So you get this tension between the needs of a, or the wants of a local, a very localized spot versus kind of a broader view. And I would put to you that in this case, uh, and I'm not surprised that some members of the community have come forward saying, yeah, we don't want the cars here. Send them somewhere else, narrow the street down. We want to take our space back. Yes. And then I guess council has to think about the larger need, right? Exactly. Um, and I just, I wondered if you would offer any advice to council about trying to balance those out. Because you, you get the, the pickle we're in, right? We've got two clashing interests right here. I would not uh, dream of uh, offering council advice on, on, on pol political matters. <laughs> I, I certainly, uh, uh, you know, you have a difficult job, that's for sure. Uh, but I, the only advice I would say is don't narrow the key north-south road in, 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 in Toronto and Ontario. Okay, I think that's it for you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. We didn't think you were 80. That was actually associated with the individual before you. It's an organization called 880. Right. Um, so I don't know if you misread that or... No, I, I was just joking. Oh, you're being funny. Okay, that was a good one. Good one. <laughs> All right. 
Gideon Foreman, welcome Gideon. You've got three minutes and probably some questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, this morning, almost afternoon. My name is indeed Gideon Foreman. I'm a policy analyst with the David Suzuki Foundation. We're here today to strongly support the Transform Young proposal that would put protected bike lanes on Young Street. We believe the proposal is balanced, cost-effective, and fair to all road users. As the study team notes in recommending Transform, this option means lower cost and shorter construction time. In fact, staff estimate, as you know, it will be about $20 million cheaper than the other viable option. We believe this better price, combined with less road building disrup uh, disruption, should make it popular with the public. The study team suggests that Transform will not negatively impact motorists. The team foresees, and I quote, little change to travel time or average speed for drivers, unquote. As well, of course, the proposal will create new full-time parking on side streets like Beecroft. Staff make a point of saying that Transform will bring, quote, safer travel conditions for all users, unquote. This only makes sense. When we physically separate cars and bikes, the roadway becomes more orderly and predictable, and everyone benefits. Motorists know where cyclists will be, and cyclists know where motorists will be. The science shows that cycle tracks reduce the risk of injury for bike riders, that's well established. But we also know from projects such as Bluer that cycle tracks increase comfort for drivers. Last year, the city found nearly two thirds of motorists feel comfortable driving next to cyclists on Bluer, up from just 14% in 2015 when the bike lane didn't exist. Transform Young will also benefit local businesses. Enlarging sidewalks, planting new trees, and bringing in street furniture and public art should attract more walk-in customers, which can only help neighborhood stores and restaurants. The wider sidewalks, of course, should be especially advantageous for establishments that rely on summer patios. In sum, like other good city building projects, Transform Young doesn't pit one group against another. Rather, it offers advantages to all of us cyclists and motorists, pedestrians, and local merchants alike. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. You're always very succinct. Any questions? Thank you. From the visiting councillors first, any visiting? Okay, no, uh, from the committee, Councillor Mamaliti. So are you said that, uh, that this doesn't pit one, one group against another? That's our view, Councillor. Have you, have you done any, dis, uh, any <clears throat> have you knocked on any doors in Willowdale? I haven't knocked on doors in Willowdale. It's based on going to the consultations and reading carefully the, I think, very well-written and thoughtful staff report. Does, does the Suzuki Foundation support these kinds of ventures without it being discussed uh, democratically in an election? Well, it's a difficult question, Councillor. We certainly support uh, robust democratic discussion of any issue that the public has to make a decision on. So it would make some sense at least to defer this off until after next election. Well, I think you raise an important question, Councillor. There's certainly the, the need to debate issues in any democracy, and we're blessed to be living in one. But I think the, the democratic issue, the need for our elected representatives to discuss issues, will be satisfied when council has an opportunity at the end of this month, when all councillors will be at the full city council, they'll have the opportunity then to debate this. So communities should just rely on 44 yahoos. Um, I'm, I'm not- 45 with the mayor. I, I, I wouldn't answer a question like that, Councillor. Okay. My, my point is, I, it's, it's hard for me to understand that the Suzuki Foundation wouldn't want a local community to have some input with respect to a project like this. Well, we certainly believe, Councillor, I'll just repeat myself, in robust democratic participation in any important decision. So it does make sense to wait until after next election. We think the needs of democratic decision making are met when you and other councils will debate this at the end of the month at the full council. So we are the, we should be the voice of the community, is that it? That's not what I said, councillor. I'm trying to figure out what you're saying, but thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, councillor uh, Perutza is next. Understanding how uh, these, um, these projects, uh, you know, sort of um, get imagined, uh, come here, uh, and then we finally 
moved them through the system, they generally span two or three administrations and lots of elections, right? Don't they? I mean, really. If it's a major project council, you know better than I that it yeah. often takes time to, to do diligence and, and right. think things through so, fully. So, so, so we'll approve this now, then later at some point we'll, uh, if we do that, we'll try to figure out where some monies might come for, uh, um, uh, from for it. An election will come, there'll be a big heated conversation throughout the election, both at the local level between, between the local councilor and any other potential candidates that might come forward. Uh, there'll be mayor, the mayor's um, his election will probably touch on the subject when they migrate up into that area in one of the local debates and there'll be a conversation uh, about this subject matter. Um, and, and isn't that, isn't, wouldn't you consider that sort of the, the broad community consultation around a major initiative like this? I mean, isn't that the way it works? It certainly sounds like it, Councillor. I understand there's been a series of meetings. I attended some of them in, in, in the ward. And uh, there's a huge amount of debate in the press, which there should be, and a deb debate among you and other councillors. So it seems to me that the debate has been robust and will continue to be. Right. Uh, t so, you know, harking back to some of the other major capital initiatives, uh, sort of we've, we've uh, d or decisions that we've taken, uh, whether it be the Gardner Expressway, the one stop uh, Scarborough subway option versus others. Uh, they've spanned a, a couple of elections now. There have been really robust consultations around the, those initiatives. Uh, there have been uh, several elections fought over them. The next election will be fought over those same issues uh, all over again. Uh, isn't that the way it works? It, it certainly seems to be on those major capital yeah. projects. There's a lot of so, 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 multi-year so, debate. So, so when someone says, oh, wow, shouldn't we have an election? We are going to have an election, right, on this? We, yes, we will. But we also feel strongly that the Transform Young proposal is a thoughtful, carefully laid out proposal that's been uh, very well put together by city staff. And we believe that the city should move ahead with it now. Right. So, so we move it forward. Uh, we sort of fine tune it. Uh, we lay out some objections. Uh, we, we, we comment on some of the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the better elements of the plan, and then, and then it's a little more refined, and then there's an election, and then there's a big debate on a more refined uh, uh, project, and then we move it forward, and there might even be another election after that for over the same issue. Yeah, yes, it often goes that way, Councilor. Exactly. Yes, I think that's accurate. No, I changed my mind. Thank you. You're welcome. I was just trying to help. What is what's what's uh, your foundation's uh, opinion or opinion on on vehicle congestion and what it well, does? It's an important question. I mean, um, it's an urgent issue. I think for all of us, not just for our foundation, but for all of us who are concerned about making cities livable. I guess our view, Councillor, is that if we want to speak to congestion, and we must, we need to give Torontonians a variety of options so that they can leave the car at home more often. And we think that building out complete streets where people are able to walk more easily and cycle more easily, where public transit is accessible, uh, those are the sorts of things that ultimately really will speak to congestion. So would it, would it surprise you or are you aware that currently, during rush hour especially, Young Street is backed up all the way to Wilson? And Wilson now gets backed up because people get off at Avenue Road drive down Wilson, um, it's backed up all the way to Avenue Road. I, I don't drive there myself, Councillor, but I'm not at all surprised to hear that's the case. So would it not then, if imply if we're taking away a lane of traffic, especially during rush hour, that's going to back Young Street up even further? Well, it's not just a matter of taking out, with all due respect, it's not just a matter of taking out a lane of traffic, it's also a matter of reconfiguring the street so that it's more amenable to walkers and cyclists and the hope is that over time some of those folks who are in cars will find ways to take the other means of transportation walking cycling or public transit and so that in that way we will reduce the number of cars along that artery but people who are commuting in from outside the city are further away than avenue road the suburbs they're not necessarily going to commute by cycle by bicycling into the city? Uh, not the necessarily, city. Those, although some of them may over time. We certainly know in other countries that's common now. I think it will happen here over time. But our hope would be for those people who have extremely long distances that they would take public transit. And that's why the city and the province are building out in a very, I think, a good way, a, a vast network of public transit services. So we would want to incentivize those folks to take public transit if they weren't able to walk or cycle. 
It's Councillor Holiday. So there's 55,000 cars on the road. And if we reduce capacity of those lanes by 50%, where, where do the cars go? Well, again, again, uh, Councillor, I, I guess we, our foundation would answer your question in a similar way to, to the previous question uh, from Councillor Carmichael Greb. Um, we need over time, it won't happen overnight, but we need over time to give people alternatives to the car if we are serious about busting congestion. And the way we do that is to give people alternatives like cycling, walking, and public transit. Okay. Keeping roads wide and facilitating to the maximum extent possible car transit will not help us to tackle congestion in we, our view. We ruin car transit to force them out. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say ruin and we're not forcing. The purpose here, Councillor, is to give people alternatives and to incentivize. Okay, and if so, we make so bike lanes safe and give people that option, then some of those people will migrate to bikes. So in your view, it would be okay if cycling lanes went on one of the side streets on Beecroft, because we're putting cycling lanes in. Well, we think Young get... Street is, did you want me to answer? Well, you know, just to that point, why is it more important that they're on Young and not on a parallel? Sure, no, it's an excellent question. We've given it a lot of thought, and I had extensive discussion with staff about it. It's an excellent question. It's not easily answered. I think that the thing to, to think about is that for exactly the reason that drivers want to be on Young Street, so do cyclists. Young Street is an attractive place. I spend up there. My in-laws are in Willowdale. So for the exact reason that drivers want to get to the theaters at Empress or the Performing Arts Center or the restaurants along Young Street, so do cyclists. So cyclists will always use Young Street in our view, Councillor. So we have a choice. We can either make Young Street safe for those cyclists or we can continue with the status quo where it's not particularly safe for cyclists. So we think we need as a community to make it safer for cyclists. They will always be there in our view. And so if, it, if the report is true, it's 1% you know, cyclists and 99% other mode, it's a, good, it's a fair trade to take 50% of the capacity out for that small portion, knowing that we could also implement bicycle lanes which are parallel. It's a fair trade. If the goal is to be fair to drivers, then what we want to do is reduce congestion. And the way you reduce congestion, again, is to give people alternatives to get out of the car. So we think it's fair to put in bike lanes. If the percentage of people using the bike lanes is small now, then surely the solution is to make bike lanes more attractive so we can grow the percentage of people who use bike lanes. Okay, and then and public transit really doesn't enter this debate because there's already a subway there. I'm not sure what your question well, is. Well, you mentioned is, public is, transit. Is one public of the transit other, in, the, in the previous answer, you mentioned public transit was it, an important part of one Absolutely, of hundred percent. But, 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 but is there public any transit is to the width of lanes on Young Street to public transit. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm missing your question. Well, you said that when you know, one of the other alternates that that to uh, Councillor Carmichael Greb was you know you get people out of their cars. That's right. And you get them on bikes. Right. You also mentioned the importance of public transit. Yes. And the network we're building. Does public transit related any, in any way to the decision on whether to have four or six lanes? Is public transit related to that decision? We, we don't want to pit one of these against each other, if that's what you're saying. We need to give people a whole range of options so they can leave the car at home so we can bus congestion. Bike lanes will be one of those options, walking will be another, and public transit will be another as well. Thank you, it's Councillor Chin Lee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, in your answer to uh, Councillor Michael, Michael Grabs, uh, you say put people on the front uh, to uh, public transit. Have you not been watching the news lately that uh, the young line at peak hour is overcrowded? So, uh, you know, if you load them up in the north end, mm -hmm. you'll be all even more overcrowding in the south end. So, what was your answer to that? Yes, it's an, there's no easy answers there. Yes, I'm on the Young Subway frequently and it is very crowded, so we need to find ways to be able to put more public transit on, not less. We, we may need to supplement Young with bus service uh, to, to help with that in the short term. Um, there's oh, no easy yes, answer. Talking about event, the buses event. are now on Young Street, which makes it even further, further, uh, less safe, right? Uh, no, I don't see why it would be less safe if we put more buses. They're driven by professional buses. drivers. I, I don't see the safety. To best my knowledge, I don't think we decrease safety by putting more public transit buses on. Okay. That, Thank you. Okay, I think now we're finished, Gideon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Keeping my eye on the time. Thank you for your time today. Samantha Green is our next speaker. Welcome, Samantha. Got three minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Dr. Samantha Green. I'm a family physician and also the co-founder of the group Doctors for Safe Cycling. Our members include trauma surgeons, family doctors, ER physicians from every hospital in Toronto, and many prominent chiefs of emergency medicine. We also have physicians from every ward in the city. Our supporters include the ER chiefs of St. Mike's, Michael Guerin Hospital, Mount Sinai, University Health Network, and Scarborough Centenary. I am here today to urge you to choose the Transform Young option, which includes the installation of cycle tracks on Young Street. Doctors for Safe Cycling is a group of doctors who recognize the health benefits of cycling for our patients and for our community. We also know from dozens of large, well-designed studies that cycling is only safe for and appealing to our patients when they have access to a robust network of safe cycling infrastructure. As doctors, we want to stress to the members of this committee that insuffic insufficient bicycle infrastructure in Toronto has a real human cost. We see this every day in our offices and emergency rooms. It is dangerous to ride a bike on Toronto's streets. Just in the last few months, in fact, a patient from my practice uh, was uh, collided with a truck in the area under study and his neck was broken. Uh, this has been, of course, quite devastating. The onus has always been on those who ride bikes to protect themselves. They're told, wear a helmet, use lights on your bike, ride on the street, side streets. But we know that that's not enough. Without proper infrastructure, people who ride bikes can do everything to protect themselves and still be severely injured or die. Indeed, the stretch of young under study has been identified as a priority corridor for safety improvements under the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan adopted by City Council in 2016. Since 2010, there have been 83 reported collisions between drivers and vulnerable road users in the area, with six lanes of fast-moving traffic, no dedicated bicycling infrastructure, and inadequate sidewalks. This section of Young Street is a danger zone. Fully segregated cycle tracks on Young will prevent injuries and deaths for those who ride bicycles. Multiple studies demonstrate that cycle tracks decrease the risk of injuries and deaths to cyclists by 90% and also reduce the risk of injury and death to pedestrians by about 30%. Those in cars will also feel safer since, the roads, since roads with cycle tracks are more predictable. In fact, as Gideon already mentioned, on Bloor last year, the city found that most motorists now feel more comfortable driving next to cyclists on Bloor. The Transform Young design will make the streets safer and promote health and well-being for all road users and community members. Streets must be designed for the safety of all road users. The ongoing failure to do so will result in continued tragedy. Transform Young will save lives. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, Councillor Shiner, go ahead. Thank you for coming. You said the, not, the sidewalks were far too narrow. Could you tell me where? Uh, sorry, I, I just I can't tell you where, but I do know that the proposal does increase the width of the sidewalk. By five meters. Right. Do you know that besides the public right-of-way, which is there now, all new developments, and most of that area has been built that way, are now required to set back four meters as to provide for an enhanced pedestrian way? So if we are able to acquire the four meters, are we not then if able to provide the safe pedestrian way that you're looking for? Potentially, although that doesn't address the issue of people on bicycles. I wasn't talking bicycles yet. And then where you talk for safety for, for everyone. So in the plan that's there, where are the locations that people with disabilities and or seniors are able to stop and use that roadway right during rush hour or off rush hour because it's only cycle lanes and there's no designated spaces or locations for those with disabilities to stop. They would have to park around the corner and find a way to get back to the main street. Right, so as I, as I mentioned, we know that installing cycle tracks and widening sidewalks actually calms the traffic and makes the, the street safe for all users, including those with disabilities. But how do you get to the sidewalk if you can't get your car or your taxi there? Like, how do you get out of your accessible taxi? How do you have your family 
get Turn you the there. corner onto the side street. In the winter time where the snow is? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, is that it? Uh, Councilor Mamalady. I assume you don't live in the area? I do not, but as I mentioned, people in, uh, members of my group do live in the do area. Do you visit the area frequently? Uh, I have been to the North York Center a few times, yep. So there is a there is a subway right, right underneath the road there. You're aware of that, right? Yep. Are you aware? I biked up there, though, when I went there. So you, you, you're familiar with, with the traffic implications that are there already? Uh, sorry, I don't understand the question. There's traffic there. There are cars who use the road. Regularly, it's, 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 sometimes it's a parking lot. You're aware of that? Sure. So in the staff report, I do know that uh, the proposal would only increase traffic not time a, by about I'm, one minute. I get it. I'm, I'm not asking you what's in the staff report. Okay. I'm asking whether or not you've got some experience in the neighborhood. Not driving, no, because I usually ride my bicycle. So, so, so have you been up there uh, to see the, the blockage of vehicles in that community? I haven't noticed that, no. No. You know there's a subway there already, right? Yes. So that subway hasn't been able to take people out of their cars. They're still using the network. I don't understand. You don't agree? Okay, well. Um, uh, do you believe by narrowing the road that uh, those, those cars are going to disappear? Well, some of the cars will actually be removed from the road because people will be more likely to walk or bicycle or use public transit. Well, and it's in the staff report that traffic time won't increase. How, how do you know proposal. that? How do you know that? How do you know that people are going to stop That's what happened in other. Their... That's what happens in other areas. But how do you know that? Not the first time people have installed bike lanes. I get that, but how do you know that? How do you know they're going to get out of their car and take a bike? It's what's happened in other areas. Where? In the south. Multiple cities. Yeah. How do you know that? You, you, like, is, is there a, is there a study you can point me to? Is there a is there a report that, that clearly specifies that this is what's happened in a particular neighborhood? Sure. Yeah. Which one is that? <laughs> you don't. The reason I'm saying this is because what you just read, you read exactly the same wording at, the, at one of the last uh, works committees. You're, you're, Never. It's like you guys pull that out of your, of your file please. every time there's a bike lane being proposed in the city. Could you ask a question, please? What's your question? Is it exactly the same speech that you give us? Uh, I've never spoken before Pewick before. Oh. Well, then somebody grabbed it the last time. It's exactly the same speech. Somebody else. Okay. Is there any other questions, Councillor Holliday? Uh, thank you for speaking to us, and I appreciate um, your desire for more bicycle infrastructure because of the trauma you've seen, right? Can you um, elaborate as to why you would support the option to put the lanes on Young? over the parallel street on Beecroft? Certainly Beecroft would be better than nothing, um, but uh, people will always bike on Young, uh, and this way we're ensuring their safety. But you mentioned separated cycle tracks where, you know, we're really, that's the ultimate, right? To reduce conflict with vehicles and pedestrians to make it safer. Would you not agree, you know, that, that cycle track on this street or that street are equally safe? But the, the issue is that people aren't necessarily going to detour to a side street because there's a cycle track there. People are going to use the quickest destination to get, to the quickest route to get to their destination and the destination is going to be on Young Street because that's where entertainment is, restaurants, offices. Even if one's safer? Often, yes, that's what happens. Okay, would you, would you, so the traffic volumes are different on Young and Beecroft. I think the report says 18,000 to 55,000 cars. Would you not agree that a cycle track on Beecroft would be safer than Young, given the volumes and potential for conflicts? I don't know. I guess I'd have to look at some of the data, but I, I think that for cyclists in general, it would be safer to have a bike lane on Young Street because cyclists are going to be using Young no matter what. Because that is where there's no restaurants on Beecroft. The restaurants are on Young Street. Thank you. Okay, uh, this committee is uh, recessed until 1.30. We have 19 more speakers. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I, I'd li on a point of uh, privilege, I'd like to test it with a motion, if you allow me, to work through lunch. Uh, we can probably be finished uh, at the time that we're going to be back anyway, if we allow people to depute. Well, I already, I already. Did.
uh, my understanding is that people have meetings set up for the lunch hour, so. We tried. <laughs>